Hey guys, how you doing? <clears throat> Hold on, let me set it up. Okay. Okay. Now we're ready. <clears throat> Do me a favor. Hey, Trent, how are you, brother? Everyone, hit the like button if you can. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Share this on your social media platforms. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. What's up, Hope? Sorry to disappoint you guys. I was supposed to be in Florida today. G26, how are you, brother? Sargon D, what's up? L for love. You can thank Sal Racinos for these killer thumbnails. Lord Jesus, bless that brother. Bless all of you. The Lord Jesus, bless all of you. The Lord Jesus, bless your loved ones. The Lord Jesus, bless my daughters, their mother. The Lord Jesus, bless me for his glory. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Sorry to disappoint you guys. I was supposed to go to Florida. I was supposed to be in Florida today. I was going to get there today if the Lord had willed. And I was going to be there till May 2nd. Okay. Okay, well, Ahmed, come and I'll answer the question. Come on board here. Let's see if you're serious, Ahmed. <laughs> Another guy who asked a question we've answered 10 million times. What happened is I hit a slump on Sunday. Sunday I hit a slump and I got really depressed and I didn't feel like traveling. Yeah. Ryan, why don't you go get the hell out of here. Go and eat your vomit, you filthy, stupid, satanic dog. You don't know anything about identity because you still don't know what your identity is, you filthy bastard. So get out of here. Anyway, Ahmed, if you have that question you want me to answer, come on. Yeah. Ryan, you don't even know your mother's identity. So that your mother violates <clears throat> human identity because she's no human. She's a female dog that gave birth to you. So get that out of here, dude. You and your logic. You dumb little monkeys. No disrespect to monkeys. Lord the Father, Spirit. The demons are manifesting already. Anyway. I was supposed to be in Florida, but just fell into a slump and I didn't feel like traveling. So that means I lost a ticket, right? It was only $200 round trip and I didn't go through with it. And sadly, that means I won't be in Florida. I was supposed to be there if the Lord had permitted from today to the second. But God willing, Lord willing, I'll try to be there in the not so distant future. I have friends there that I want to see and do ministry with. So Lord willing, if my friend doesn't leave on the 3rd of May, because he said he's leaving on the 3rd of May and won't be back in June. So I'll be there sometime after June if God wills, because I want to go to Florida, reconnect with people and meet new people. And God willing, Lord willing, I want to go see my daughters. May the Lord Jesus grant them perfect physical safety, protection, health, security. And I pray that for myself as well. And the... <clears throat> And the salvation that they need and I need to delight Jesus, Jesus' heart for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. I just came from God's Logic live stream. He should be winding it down. He was there discussing with some people, and I was trying to write an article as well as join the stream. I don't like to interrupt people's streams. One thing I don't like to do. And may God purge my motives and the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit, cleanse my inclinations in the blood of Jesus Christ for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. I don't like to go on other people's streams and take over. In other words, if someone is doing a stream, I prefer to leave them alone, but there are times I can't help it. I jump on because I know where the argument's going and I know <clears throat> how to then crush the argument from its very root by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I kind of felt bad. I kept jumping in. Now, I know he doesn't mind, but I don't want to do that. It's his dream. I want the Lord to perfect him and sanctify him. And the way you'll be perfected and grow is by interaction, making mistakes, learning from his mistakes, because none of us come out of our mother's womb knowing theology. Okay, well, praise God for that. We got a praise report. But anyway, I had called out a vile, wicked Aryan heretic who was barking like a dog. And David Wood's comment section, again, because he's of his father, the devil, E-E-W, a fake, who's like his father, the devil, a liar. He lied in the comment section saying that he could refute the Trinity and that I couldn't refute him and I blocked him. Whereas we have the sessions recorded. I blocked that filthy, vile troll because he doesn't answer questions. He runs because he's a coward and a tool of the devil. 
So then I unblocked him and I called him out and said, listen, little girl, we're waiting. Bring your bite with your bark so I can completely decimate you and silence you and expose you for being of your father, the devil, worshiping a false god. So let's see if that coward's going to contact me and he'll show up. Filthy, wicked people. They prove that they belong to Satan when they lie and slander people. Because what did our Lord Jesus say in John 8, 44? You are of your father, the devil, who is a liar and a murderer. Liar and a murderer. Right? When he lies, he speaks his native tongue because he's the father of lies. So may the Lord Jesus save us from Satan. May the Lord Jesus save us from the world. May the Lord Jesus save us from our own flesh and our own lusts. Mr. Zale, you were the guy that was barking earlier. So here you go, Mr. Zale. Come on. So I can then muzzle you and stuff you with your vomit and expose Muhammad for being a son of the devil. So Mr. Zale, come on. May the Lord Jesus destroy our flesh, destroy the fruits of our flesh. May the Lord Jesus destroy the lust of our eyes, our pride, our arrogance, our ego. May the Lord Jesus destroy fake piety, fake humility, fake humbleness, fake spirituality. May the Lord Jesus purge us, our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, Michelle, in the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse, wash, <clears throat> purify us, our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, Michelle, in his blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus feed all of us. <clears throat> and when I pray for us, I pray for our loved ones, my daughters, their mother his holy flesh, and give to all of us <clears throat> his precious blood for our salvation, for our healing, for our medicine, for our nourishment, for our protection, redemption, and deliverance. May the Lord Jesus sit and throne upon our hearts and increase in us. May we decrease. May the Lord Jesus <clears throat> beatify us with his beauty. May the light of the Lord Jesus shine in and through us, destroying the darkness in us and around us. May we be the Lord Jesus Christ to our neighbors, even to our enemies. May the Lord Jesus save us from being politically correct, from prostituting ourselves for numbers, for money, for status. May the Lord Jesus <clears throat> purge us of any ulterior motives. May the Lord Jesus constrain us by his all-powerful word to be doers of his word, not hypocrites, destroying the beams from our eyes, destroying hypocrisy, never allowing us to betray or deny or blaspheme or shame the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or to fall into any scandal. But seal us by the Spirit to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, to love the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly. May the Lord Jesus transform us to reflect Him more perfectly, to love Him more passionately, to live for Him more faithfully. May the Lord Jesus strengthen my throat, my heart, my arteries, my lungs, and chest with the health I need from the breath of life, the eternal Spirit, whom He pours out from the Father and floods us in the glorious presence of the beautiful Holy Spirit. May the Spirit fill me to overflowing and give me the discipline I need to stay healthy and fit and use my health to serve you, the church, and to offer my body as a living sacrifice, showing the Lord Jesus that I love him. May we be doers of his word <clears throat> and never, never utter any wicked, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous word against the Lord Jesus Christ, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. May the Lord Jesus perfect the gifts he's given me for ministry and use it lawfully to glorify him and build you up and never bring attention to myself. Perfect recall of every jot, tittle, and portion of scripture and exegete scripture, and then empower us to then live out the scripture, proclaim that scripture, and love that scripture, even unto death by the power of the Holy Spirit, to show we love the Lord Jesus Christ until the Lord Jesus returns, and may he return sooner than later. And may the Lord Jesus reinvigorate us, rejuvenate us, replenish us, refresh us, regenerate us, revive us by the fountain of living waters, the Holy Spirit, and fill us with the fruit of the Spirit, destroying our flesh and the fruits of the flesh, and may the Lord Jesus empower us to crush that of Satan on our feet by the power of the blood of his cross, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that blood covering our loved ones, my daughters, their mother. May the Lord Jesus take over this session, take over the ministries, take over our lives and own us fully. And all we have, we give to him gladly, our money, everything to the Lord Jesus. And may he possess our loved ones, my daughters and their mother. And may the Lord Jesus bless the internet connection, the audiovisual qualities. And may I not be a distraction to my neighbors. And may the Lord Jesus make my voice pleasing to your ears and bring people in droves for his glory, not for my praise, and give us the gift of contentment. Increase in us, Son of God, and teach us how to love you, how to worship you, how to glorify you, how to adore you, how to live for you, how to obey your word, how to pray, how to fast, how to praise, and how to serve one another by our deeds as one of the fruits that we love you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified. Bless this session. Muzzle these dogs. Teach them the fear of the Lord. Shame them. 
and use us as your hands and feet and your mouthpiece to muzzle them for your glory, Lord Jesus, the glory you possess and in separate union with the Father and the Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. So guys, you know the rules. Do not engage trolls. Do not get into side talk. Focus, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to stay attentive because this is a class we want the Spirit to teach. So I'm going to ask you questions. When you get distracted, you distract me. Don't do that, please. All right, now we have someone. It's going to be a troll again. Watch her. No, yes? I'm not, I'm not a troll, bro. Can okay, you hear me get now? to the mic, though, because we can hardly hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah, you're that uh, Mohammedan troll. Yeah, the guy that was running your mouth out in the comment section. Yeah? Uh, you ain't got to be... We can just Listen, don't tell me. You want me to block you? Stop appealing to sympathy. Let's get to the heart of the matter. Stop whining. You want to defend Muhammad? Is that it? Yeah. You can't defend Muhammad. It's impossible. He's an antichrist. All right, go ahead. You sure? Bring your argument. Okay, go to chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. Get ready chapter to read your Quran for me. Chapter 4, verse 24. Yeah, speak louder in the mic because you're going to help me to expose Muhammad for the glory of Jesus Christ. So get ready. I bet. Okay, well, good. Yeah, keep it. Go to 420. I allowed to See if you can, you can control yourself because if you manifest, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm not gonna make it easy for you. So read 424. So this one say, yeah. Uh, can you read the verse? I, I'm reading. Okay, so don't give me any commentary. Go to the and verse. Also to you. All married women except those who right hand possess. Okay, read it again. Also, prohibited to you are all married women except those who your right hand possess. Can I explain? What does that mean? Oh, what is okay? So, I'll give you the hadith. I want to see if you know your Quran. What does that mean? I uh, got you. This one means like the slave woman that you captive in the in the who's war. married, right? The slave woman you captive on war. Yeah, who's married, right? So they don't have no access to their husband anymore because their husband Why might die. Why don't they die. have access to their husband? Their husband might die. No, that's not what or it says. Or they're going to be a slave. They're not going to be free to go to back to their husband. No, that's because the is. husband and the wife are captured. That's Sunan Abu Dawood, 2150. So don't lie to me. So let's let and me. And you have to marry them before you have any. No, you're lying. You're lying. Listen, I'm going to insult okay. your prophet for lying. Don't lie to me. I'm going to insult your prophet for lying. If you're going to lie like your prophet, I'll give you the hadiths. I don't no, want to you're lying through your teeth. You don't marry them. You can have sex with them and sell them off as captives, even if their husbands are alive. So can stop you lying. Say you can have sex with them. So now let me ask you a question. If you were living in time, Muhammad, and he attacked your village, would you be okay if he took your mother and they had sex with her? So like if my mother is not a Muslim. Oh, so you're okay. Say they louder. If your mother's her. not a Muslim, say it again. See, if she's a pagan. So if your mother was a pagan, you'd be okay if the Muslims took her and had sex with her? Not has marry her. And be, no, her, it doesn't say Muslim. marry her, you lying, stone-licking pagan. Med, marry her and marry Give me the hadith pagan. where it says marry her. Because I have the hadith right in here. Give them to me. Give me the hadith where it says you got to marry her. Bro, Give I'm, it the, I'm reading the... I'm reading uh, the um, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. And Ibn Kathir doesn't say that. I have it in front of me. I so can you read what you have? Yes. In fact, you read it. Go ahead. You have it, right? Read it for me. Hey, bro, can you pass me the book, please? Read it for me. Wait. Let me get the book. Hey, bro, can you pass me the book? Can you pass me volume one? Go ahead. Guys, did you hear it? He said it's okay if his pagan mother got captured and got raped. <clears throat> Bro, I didn't okay. say that. I say marry her, bro. What are you talking okay, about? Okay, so you're okay if your father's still alive and someone takes your mother captive and marries her. So that means you're if a filthy bastard pagan, but that I you would say it's okay. If my mother is Muslim, so what's the, what's your, the what? 
Think yeah, about that is a pagan. Think about that is a Christian. Like your ancestors Christian. were not Muslims and they got raped, you filthy pagan. Now read Ibn Kathir. Uh, let me find you the need verse. to be in jail because you're dangerous in society, you pervert. But read now Ibn Kathir. So I got a book here. So read Ibn Kathir before I send you to Mecca to lick the black stone. Oh, why you gotta do it like that? Can you read it? I'm Don't reading. Delay. I'm finding the verse, bro. Okay, you're finding the verse, bro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not Surah Al-Baqarah. It's Surah Al-Nisa. No, I know. I know what I'm talking about, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking. Uh... I have it right here. By the way, here's Tafsir bin Kathir, guys, because I'm going to expose this liar. Here it is, the link for all of you. But I want him to read, see if he's going to read honestly. So there's the link, guys. Let's see if he's going to read honestly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, the book is long, bro. Really? It's long? Here, let me get you a link. Then you can read it. Here. Let's see. I want you Where's to read the link. I have the book, bro. Then get to it, bro. This volume only has total uh, bro. Let me bring another book. This is volume one. I need volume two. I'm sorry, yeah. Get the hell out of here. All right, what do you need? Hello, yes. Who are you? What do you need? Yes, I just uh, have a question regarding uh, the Trinity. I, I mean, I have uh, friends. You? Sorry, what are you? I'm a Christian, but I have Muslims that's always asking oh. me about the Trinity. So, right. like, uh, I have just a question if you. What is have, it? The point. Yeah, yeah. How can we, and uh, in the easiest way, explain the Trinity for them? For like, there's no are... easy way to explain God. It's like saying, what's the easy way to explain God? God by nature is incomprehensible and infinite. So, what do you mean easy way? What easy way is there to explain God? uh with easy i mean like how can uh, i mean f because they always think that we worship three gods so who cares what they think about what we worship i don't care for their opinion yeah but how can we uh, give them like an evidence that we don't worship no, three say, gods i would say what makes you think that it's three gods why are they three gods what are they going to tell me because in like for instance they refer to Matt 28 19 when yeah, Jesus so what makes you think it's three gods don't give me a verse I know the verse what makes mm. you think it's three gods uh, because we pray in like the father sons and the Holy Spirit so why would three persons end up being three gods mr. Zale I ran like your mother ran from the Shia when they treated your mother like a whore a Shia whore so get the out here mr. Zale you filthy scum we got you on record saying yeah, if your mother was a pagan, you'd be okay with the Muslims raping her like a whore. Oh, but it's marriage. Get the hell out of here, man. You disgrace. Someone like you needs to be in jail because you're dangerous. You're a murderer. May the Lord Jesus expose you and imprison you. You filthy, dangerous pagan. You're filthy like Muhammad. May the Lord Jesus destroy Muhammad as he already is in hell, but erase him from the earth. Okay, so what makes three persons three gods? How, how do you mean? What makes three persons three gods? Mm. Because you're saying Father, Son, and Spirit, that's three gods. Why? Why do they have to be three gods? Why would three persons have to be three gods? Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, so you see, that was my first question to them. Yeah. What makes these three persons three gods? Why is it that if they're three persons, they have to be three gods? So I would then wait for them to answer. Mm. Okay. And like... Uh... Uh, so I, I, if I if I got it right, I also heard like they have some type of like do you call it tawhid or something like that? Yeah, that's yeah. that's a big toe, mm. and they want you to heed heed their toe. Okay, so what's the point though? Yeah, I just uh, want like an an easy explanation how what, what I can respond to them. But yeah, just that. That's you, just you can't, brother, you can't ask me generalities, uh, general. Tawhid is a lie. Okay, next. You got to be specific. Either yeah, be my, specific. Yeah, my specific question was from the beginning how we can explain the Trinity simplified uh, to, uh, to okay, those. What do you, how do you want me to simplify? What do you want me to say to them? That Father, Son, and Spirit are three persons, one God. Okay. Yeah, and for instance, when they say, they always like bring it up. Uh, if Jesus is God, how, why did he pray to the Father? 
Well, you know, you know, you need to leave my channel. You know that, right? What's, uh, why? Why? Because I've answered this question ten thousand times. I just did a session on Jesus praying to the Father and how Allah prays. So you need to go because you're not serious. Because if you're serious, you'd be watching. So now you got to get out of here, okay? Yeah, no problem. Okay, get out of here. Yeah, another fake. Anyway, guys, this is not a politically correct channel. Now, with that said, I'm hoping that. Okay, I'm hoping that Unitarian Aryan heretic lying son of the devil will show up. E E W, you wicked lying son of the devil. You're like your father devil, and you worship a false god. I hope you show up. Anyway, for the rest of you, help me to help you. Let's stay focused. Okay, let's stay focused. You got this guy Zael Ibarra admitting. If his mother was a pagan, he'd be okay with the Muslims taking her captive and marrying her, which means raping her and then selling her off because he's a bastard, son of a bastard, whose prophet is a bastard burning in hell. Now you have it on record why these people are dangerous. You need to protect yourselves against them and ask the Lord Jesus to expose them, either repent or remove them because they will do harm to human lives because they are filthy like Muhammad who's in hell. Now you heard it, right? Ibada, Mr. Zail. The guy's too stupid. He can't even find Ibn Kathir. Ah, oh, the book that we did. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. All right. Now, for the rest of you, we got a lot of things to talk about. I had done two sessions on Clubhouse last night. The first session was impromptu, so we didn't, we didn't go live on my YouTube channel. And I felt bad because it was an in-depth session on Waraka bin Nofil Muhammad and other related topics. Now, it's archived on Albi's Clubhouse page. I guess when you do a Clubhouse, it records it for you. But I didn't go live, so it's not recorded on my YouTube. But the second session on Clubhouse, that's recorded, and you see it. All right, here you go, brother. It's gone. Okay, so now, God's Logic, you sent all your guys here. I know you want your numbers to blow up, so I panhandle, and you make all the money. So here's the link. God's logic, get ready, because I got some passages to help you wrestle through the question that was asked. Hey, I bring Shamsi, and I'll bury Shamsi like Muhammad was buried in hell. And stop being a whore of Shamsi. Don't hide behind Shamsi like a little girl like Aisha playing with dolls. Be more man than Aisha. Come on, because I'll destroy Shamsi like Jesus destroyed Muhammad in hell. You stone licking pagan, you coward. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. If you're going to ask me about Acts 2.22, you're going to have to come on my channel. If you guys don't come on my channel, mainstream, you are to ask me. Don't waste my time. You're going to come here, and you're going to interact with me to explain Acts 2.22. So, okay, brother, you were talking about the Father being seen. Yeah. Then you were yeah. saying in a vision. Why did you make that qualification? When you quoted the verses that God has, cannot be seen, did it qualify it unless in a vision? No, it didn't say that. So we don't want to qualify it, right? Right, right, right. And then secondly, you'll even find the appearances of Jesus called visions. The resurrection appearances of Jesus or Jesus' transfiguration called a vision. Because if you go to Matthew 17, verse 9, after Jesus is transfigured, Moses appears, Elijah appears, and they see the cloud descend and hear God's voice audibly. There it says Jesus told them not to tell anyone of the vision. So even the use of vision... You're using it in a way that's not the way the Bible uses it. Okay. Matthew, if you go to Matthew 17, verse 9, yeah. the transfiguration is called a vision. Yeah, yeah. So what does that mean? That it didn't take place in time and space on earth? No, I, I don't believe that visions aren't yeah. like, you know, I believe that they are taking place in time and space and, you yes. know, it's, it's actually happening. But these is a supernatural thing. encounter then. Yep. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So this is supernatural. That's the same thing in Matthew 24, 22 to 24, where it says the women had a vision. They saw angels and they mm -hmm. discovered the tomb empty. Mm -hmm. Or in Acts 26, 19, where Paul is recounting his encounter with the risen Christ. And he said, I didn't prove faithless to the vision. Mm -hmm. So we have to use the term vision the way the Bible does. A vision re refers to a supernatural unveiling or revelation of God, either in your mind where you're seeing Right, either in your dream or your waking conscience, where you see heaven or God is appearing 
on the earth, face to face, or an angel yeah. is appearing. So we want to be careful with that. Yeah. Now, when people say that no one has seen God, and that means the Father hasn't been seen, but the Son has, the only problem you're going to have is that someone who knows the Bible will tell you that the Father has been seen in Daniel 7, 9 to 10, because there in Daniel 7, 9 to 10, Daniel sees the Ancient of Days. In fact, open up and read the description, because in Daniel and Revelation, Daniel and John see God the Father in visible form. Daniel 7, 9 to 10. The Ancient of Days. Yep. If you have the entire chapter open, because you're going to read also 13 and 14. But uh, start with Daniel 7, 9 to 10. <clears throat> so it says, hold on, let me let the dog out. Who let the dogs out? Who? 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 J-Mac, where you been, man? I haven't seen you in ages, bro. You back? Homie, what's up, Samui? We're going to go in depth on Waraka in a minute. Uh, Kian, footnote. You want me to send you to Rome on a pilgrimage when I just said, if you want me to answer Acts 2.22, come on my stream yard, Kian. Unless you want to go on a pilgrimage to Rome or Fatima. All right, I'm there. We ready? Okay, read for me Daniel 7, 9 to 10. All right, so it says, as I looked, thrones were placed. It's plural, right? That's right. Okay. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. So he's got a head and he's got hair that's white, right? Yeah. 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 And he's wearing clothing that's white as snow, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So keep reading. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Okay, so notice he said, I saw thrones, but the Ancient of Days only occupies one throne, right? Yeah, yeah. And the Ancient of Days appears with a white robe, white as snow, and white hair, signifying he's very old. That's why it's called the Ancient of Days. Mm -hmm. Ancient of Days, so he's very ancient. Well, if he's very ancient, that means he's very old. So that's why he appears with white hair, to signify mm -hmm. he's very old. Mm -hmm. And the white robe signifies purity and the fire of his eyes signifies that he's a consuming fire who consume you in his wrath. Yes. In fact, what issued from the throne? It says a fiery stream, right? Yeah. His throne. Yeah. Fiery flames. Do you know what that means? What does it mean? Fiery flames. Also fiery stream. That is where you get the lake of fire. The lake of fire originates from him. Yeah, a fiery stream. It's the literal translation. Yeah. So it's showing you that that lake of fire, that fiery stream, fiery lake, is actually God's wrath, which consumes evildoers because they don't repent. Because John is going to explain and comment on these Old Testament themes, symbols, and images. Because John has a lot of Daniel in it, as well as Ezekiel in it. And Isaiah in it, because John is inspired by the Spirit to now give you a more complete, fuller understanding of these visions of these prophets. Mm -hmm. But with that said, there the Ancient of Days appears visibly. So I want everyone to hear this. Now, now, yeah. hold on, this coward. One second. Go to verses 13 and 14. I'm there. Okay. So now read Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And there the ancient of days. We already saw him, but now someone else appears, the son of man. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So now the Ancient of Days is not the Son of Man. The Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. Mm. Right? Correct. By the way, you with the name Jesus, change your name because you are not 
a Christian, you are a spiritual tool of the devil. You're a spiritual bastard. You disgust me. May the Lord rebuke you. See, brother, that's why I'm not politically correct. I can't do this on your channel. Okay, so if the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days, right? Yeah. And yet the Son of Man, according to New Testament, is Jesus. That's correct. Hold on, let's... You let me know when you're available Wednesday and Thursday, and I'll make a special for your barbecue and to expose you for being a liar that's saying that supposedly I blocked you because I can answer you because I'm going to destroy your fake God by the power of Jehovah Jesus. So bring your bite, okay? So let me know when you're available Wednesday, Thursday, so I can do your funeral services. Okay, so if the Son of Man is Jesus, and yet the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, then that means the Ancient of Days is not Jesus. So then who did Daniel see? The Father. So the father appeared visibly, right? That's right. Now we can go through Revelation 4 and 5 and show you there. John, like Daniel, sees the father in visible form, in visible shape. Because in Revelation 4, he sees a throne and someone on the throne. And that one had a scroll in his right hand. Mm -hmm. Then in chapter 5, he sees the lamb taking the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. Well, if the lamb is Jesus then that means the one seated on the throne that John saw visibly with the scroll in his right hand is the Father. Yeah. So then what does it mean no one has seen God at any time? Well, it doesn't mean you cannot see the Father because then the first question is, why can't you see the Father? Why? What would the answer be? Uh, unless Jesus explains him. Unless yeah, well, that's the point. So the assumption is, well, that when they're seeing God, they're seeing Jesus, not the Father, because that's what I was hearing. And that was something... I hear Christians say often, and myself as well. But then the question would be, why can you see Jesus and not the Father? Mm -hmm. Is it because Jesus is more merciful than the Father? Blasphemy. Is it because the Father is holier than the Son? Blasphemy. So why, if Jesus is God equal to the Father, he can be seen and not the Father? Because he's more merciful loving? Blasphemy. Or the Father is holier? Blasphemy. So either answer will not suffice. Right. So... One can say, well, it's the role of Jesus to reveal the Father. That's why he comes. That's okay. That's a good answer. Or it may be something more deeper in light of the fact that John and Daniel saw the Father. The answer is, John 1, 18, if it's properly exegeted, is telling you not that you cannot perceive God the Father or see God the Father. You cannot do so apart from the Son. The Son must come and make the Father known and allow you to behold the Father. That's what it's saying in John 18. Yeah, yeah. So if the Father is going to reveal himself, he does so in and through his Son. That's mm -hmm. why Jesus says, he who sees me sees the Father. Because apart from the Son, working with the Spirit, you cannot know who the Father is, nor see him. Yeah. Makes now, there are texts that are misquoted to show otherwise. For example, one text that's misquoted is John 5, 37. Okay. Let's go there. Let me correct the misinterpretation of these passages. John 5.37. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> all right. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness. Now notice the errors of these people. Lucky Dog and RNO. If I show you Moses saw God, I'm going to have to block you. Because you just distorted, perverted what it says. I'm going to show you Moses saw God in the very chapter you're misquoting. So that means you don't know what you're talking about because you're not paying attention. Okay, now, John 5, 37. Yeah, and the Father who has sent me, has, he, he himself has borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. See, they say, see, you haven't heard his voice and seen his form. No, that's not what it means. Because if you take that to mean a blanket statement, no one has seen the Father's form or heard his voice, you got a contradiction. Right. Because right. if you go to John 12, 28 to 30, there a multitude hear the voice of the Father audibly. Mm -hmm. John 12, 28 to 30. Yeah. So if you want to read it, look at there. Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd. Oh, wait, they heard a voice audibly? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay, go ahead. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Wait, I thought you said you have never heard his voice nor seen his shape. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, he did say that, but he was talking about the people standing in front of him. Yeah. Because of your disbelief, you are unable to perceive the voice of God and realize when he's appearing to you because of your unbelief. Jesus is not saying no one at any time has ever heard the Father's voice. Because right here, they heard the Father's voice, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only there, but in Matthew 17, 5, on the Mount of Transfiguration, a cloud came down upon Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And then Peter, James, and John heard the Father's voice ought to be saying, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Right. That's right? Right. right. So wait, they heard the father's voice and they saw a cloud and they knew that the father was in the cloud. Now go to 2 Peter 1, 16, 18 to see that Peter himself, harking back to this experience, confirms they heard the majestic voice of the father bearing witness to the son. For when he, rece for when he received honor and glory from God the father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born. We from heard God. this voice. Mm -hmm. For we but I thought you said you've never heard his voice. Yeah. No, he's talking to a particular group at a particular time. He's saying your disbelief, unbelief has <clears throat> incapacitated you from recognizing the Father's voice and seeing his shape. It's your unbelief that has now hindered you from realizing when the Father speaks to you or beholding his shape. Right? Right. right. Because here it says, we ourselves heard that voice. We read that again? Yes. It says, <clears throat> we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So you got it. They heard it. What about John the Baptist in John 1, 32 to 33? That's right. Whose voice did he hear when he was commissioned? The Father's voice. Well, read John 1, 32, 33. You're going to see it there. It says, And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirits descend and remain, this is he who, will bapt who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So he heard God the Father speaking to him. And telling him, this is how you're going to know who Jesus is when you see the Spirit descend upon him. Mm -hmm. So, guys, I hope you're listening because I did multiple sessions on can God the Father be seen. It's on my YouTube channel. Just put God, Father, seen. Focus in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Don't worry about the trolls. So when Jesus says, you have neither seen his shape or heard his voice, that's not a blanket statement, meaning no one has ever heard his voice or seen his shape. It means these Jews, due to their unbelief, demonstrated that their unbelief incapacitated them from recognizing the father's voice when he speaks or is recognizing his form. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible says no one has seen God, it's much more deeper than simply seeing with the eyes. In John 1, 18 and in John 6, 45, 46, there see the word for see. You look at any Greek lexicon, the word see means also to perceive with the mind's eye. Orao means no one has perceived God, the only begotten Son, in the bosom of the Father. He has exegeted him. So what the Bible is actually saying is, you cannot know God intimately. You cannot perceive what God is like, let alone see him visibly, unless and until the Son comes, and due to the grace of the Son and the mediation of the Son, you are enabled to know God and see him. That's why whenever someone sees God, that encounter most definitely includes Jesus, but it doesn't mean the Father is not involved. If the Father is perceived and seen, that's because Jesus came 
and allowed you access to the Father. And even in the Exodus, you see this, because in Exodus 23, 20 to 23, look what it says. And the passage that's misquoted, Exodus 33, you cannot see my face, Exodus 33, 20, which is misquoted. No one finishes it. The one verse Charlie's will only quote 20, but they don't read 18 to 23. So now in Exodus 23, 20 to 23, tell me who's talking about whom. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. So who's speaking? Yahweh, the father. How do we know it's the father, not the son? Because he's talking about the angel of, of the Lord. So if the angel is Jesus, mm -hmm. that means the one speaking on the mount is the father. So the father was there. Mm -hmm. And the father says, behold, I send an angel ahead of you to do what? To guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your, your transgression, for my name is in him. So we know this angel is not a creature. This is Jesus as the Father's messenger who embodies the name of God, which is why he can do what only God can do, forgive sins. So yeah. if this is God speaking about the angel, my name is in him, meaning what I am he is. He's one with me. My nature is his nature, which is why he has the power to do what I do. Forgive sins, so you need to obey him. And that's Jesus. And the one speaking cannot be Jesus, it must be the Father. That's correct. So the Father was there. That's correct. And the Son was there. And the Holy Spirit was there. And there are references in the five books of Moses that show that the Spirit was there, active, empowering Moses and others to lead Israel. Like Numbers 11, 16 to 17, and Numbers 11, 24 to 29. But we don't need to turn there. So okay. did we establish that the Father has been seen, can be seen and heard because yes. of Jesus? Yes, because of Jesus's revelation. Yep. So That's then when someone says, well, yeah, the Father hasn't been seen, but the Son has been seen. No, the Father cannot be seen apart from the Son. But when the Son shows up, then you can see the Father and perceive him. Mm -hmm. And this is brought out explicitly, clearly in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So let's walk through that if you're okay with it. Yeah, yeah. You know I love this stuff, man. Oh, yeah. I just, well, yeah, so the just iron sharpens iron so that we're more precise in what we say. And Psalm 91 is about Jesus. So we got to be careful of terrible arguments. But anyway, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, the first five verses, but let me give you the background. Now, guys, I did sessions on these. If you go to my YouTube channel, put in God, Father, Scene. God, Father, Scene. I did multiple sessions explaining what these passages mean and do not mean so that we can be more accurate and precise in explaining what the Bible actually teaches. Now, to give you the context, this is God appearing to Samuel. Now, if you guys don't know the story, Samuel was raised with Eli, the high priest, meaning Samuel was being taught by a high priest, the law of Moses and priestly duties, because he would serve Eli in the tabernacle. The temple had been built, but there was a tabernacle. So that means Eli would have been saturating Samuel in the law of Moses. So Samuel would have known God appearing to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, known God appearing to the Israelites in Egypt, known about God raising up Moses, and he would have known the written word of God because all he would do is study the written word and then try to apply it. So he knew the word of God, meaning the written word, and he knew of God because he's being taught by a high priest and he knows he's an Israelite and he belongs to the covenant community whose God is Yahweh. So he knew all that. But now watch something interesting. Read the first five verses, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. So you caught it? He's, he's serving the Lord. So he knows the, who he's serving, Yahweh, yeah. right? Yeah. But now keep going. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. There's that word vision. Now notice what it means, the word of the Lord. It means the word of the Lord hardly showed up. Yeah. Right? So very few people had visions where the word of the Lord came to them. Now what, what word? Keep reading, you'll see. At that time, Eli, 
whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie so down he thought again. it was Eli's voice, right? So he's yeah. hearing an audible voice, right? Mm -hmm. But he's thinking it's Eli because it sounds like Eli. Because I didn't call you. And when you finish verse 5, let me know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, for, this, is for, uh, this is verse 5. So he went and laid, and, and so he went and lay down. That's now watch. Eli. He thought it's Eli calling him, right? Yeah. Now watch where you're going to see father and son working together, even in the Old Testament, enabling people to know God. Now read 6 and 7. When you finish 5, go to 6 and 7, 1 Samuel 3. Now watch 6 and 7. And the Lord God, and the Lord called again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. There's your answer. That's John 1 18. No one has seen God any time. The only begotten Son who's in the Father's wisdom has revealed him. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. You see why he did not know the Lord? Because he had yeah. not known the Word. Yeah. But hold on, you just read he was ministering before Eli in the temple, so he knew the written word, right? Yeah. So what does yeah. it mean he did not know the word? The word hadn't revealed, hadn't been revealed to him when he knew the written word. He knew the written word. So what does it mean he did not know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him? What word had not been revealed to him? The person of Christ. The, the so word here you learn two things. You can be religious and know the Bible and still not know God. Because mm -hmm. he was religious, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he was practicing the commandments, but he still did not know God intimately. Because you cannot know God apart from the word. You mm -hmm. need the word to come to you to allow you to know God and have a relationship with him. That's good. But notice, it's not just the word. It's the Lord with his word appearing. Yeah. yeah. So when the word shows up, God the Father shows up. Yes. And the spirit also shows up because they're always working together, right? Yes. Yes. Now the same chapter, 1 Samuel 3, 20 to 21. Same chapter. Now watch. Look what it says. <clears throat> and all Israel, from Dan to, Ber to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. That's John 1, 1 and 18 right there. Yeah. How did the Lord make himself known to Samuel? By the word of the Lord. Yeah. Wow. Right? Yep. Finish 21. Read it again and finish it. Yeah. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to, Sa to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So the Bible's teaching is not that you cannot see the Father. You cannot see the Father apart from the Son. But if the Son comes, he brings the Father with him and allows you to understand the Father and even behold him. Yeah, that's good. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 14, 23? That's what he, he who loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and we will make our home with him. We will come to make our home with him. Amen. You caught it? I caught it, Sam. I caught so it. No, it's not true. The father can't be seen. He cannot be understood or seen visibly apart from the son. <laughs> but when the son shows up, the father shows up and the son in his grace allows you to know the father and him and to behold them and he does it with the spirit because jesus never works apart from the spirit so another right. verse another verse that they 
they'll try to use you know this is the the one where he sa it says that he dwells in a you know an unapproachable light no, that's jesus mm. that's not the father first timothy 6 14 to 16 read it that's talking about jesus and it's true he does dwell in unapproachable light because when paul saw the light it blinded him and acts 9 1 and 9 do you remember what happened to paul yeah got knocked off his when horse the light of christ which he closed himself with manifested it blinded paul for three days until ananias laid hands on him so that's being misquoted because in first timothy 6 15 and 16 if you start at 14 the nearest antecedent is jesus it's saying jesus dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see and you know even admits this interpretation who joe's witnesses in their literature i quote them oh wow <laughs> i'll get you that oh it's in my articles and you can read online the Jehovah Witness in their literature say 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16 is talking about Jesus. So now let's go and see, is it saying the Father dwells in unapproachable light or is it referring to the Son? Go to 1 Timothy 6. Start at 14 and 16. All right, starting at 14. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time he? jesus christ now follow the pronouns he who is the blessed and only sovereign the king of kings and lord of lords who alone has immortality who dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion amen so where'd you get that it's the father Mm-hmm. Who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. It's right there. Okay. Now let me get you the references from the Job's Witnesses where they even say this is Jesus. Okay, let me find it for you. All right. First Timothy. I gotta find it because I got too many articles where I quote it. <laughs> Here it is. Now, I don't know if you can screen share. If you can. Then okay. let me get you the link and then share your screen. And we'll show it to everybody. Here's the link for you right there. This is the Jehovah Witnesses' own literature online. They admit this is Jesus, not the Father. For the rest of you, here's the link. So you got it, right? Yeah, let me just oh. uh, copy this and put it in there. <clears throat> You're going to see they applied us to Jesus. And I got two online sources for it. So that's okay. right. Here, highlighted, right? Yeah, if you want to enlarge a little bit, because I can't see it. I don't know if they can. Okay, now read what it says. Who do they apply 1 Timothy 6.15 to? Watch. Jehovah and Jesus Christ. Jehovah is the happy God, and his son, Jesus Christ, is called the happy and only potent. Potent. Potentate, yeah, potentate, however, happy and only potentate, right? Ha yeah, happy and only potentate. So what are they applying to Jesus? Which verse? First Timothy 6.15. Yeah. And they apply First Timothy 1.11 to the Father. Wow, that's crazy. That's funny. They have these links, man. But here's yeah. another one for you. This is another one of their sources, and here it is. Open it up if you can. Okay. Right? Now watch the other source. This one comes from, that was, the first one was from Aid to Bible Understanding. This one's from Insight on the Scriptures, Volume 1. <clears throat> All right. First Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Yeah, but now so, read it from where it says uh, that he did not possess immortality. Start from there because it's not about Jesus. Uh, where did that? It it's up there. It says right after Jesus where it says that he did not possess oh. immortality yeah. that he did not possess immortality before his resurrection by god is seen from the inspired apostles words romans 6 and 9. christ now that has that he has been raised up from the dead dies no more death is master over him no more for this reason when describing him as the king of those who rule as kings and Lord of those who rule as lords, 1 Timothy 6, shows that Jesus is distinct from 
all such other kings and Wait, lords. You said they applied First Timothy 6, 15, 16 to Jesus? To Jesus, yes. So they're telling you it's Jesus? Yeah, they are. So two Jehovah Witness sources say First Timothy 6, 15, 16 is about Jesus, not the Father? Yeah. Yeah, because that's what it is. Now be wary of even Trinitarian translations that insert the word God in 15 when it's not in the Greek. There are some translations that will add the word God in verse 15, meaning the Father, and confuse you. The Greek, there is no, that's he. And the he refers to Jesus in verse 14. So how can this be used against Jesus when it's about Jesus? Because the light that Jesus now cloaks himself with, you can't approach it. It blinds you. Isn't that what happened to Paul? That's exactly what happened to Paul. So why do you think Paul is mentioning it? Because he experienced the light and how it blinded him. Yeah, it's clear. Which is now proof Jesus is Jehovah Almighty because what Paul said about Jesus, Psalm 104, verses 2 to 3, say about Yahweh. Go to Psalm 104, 2 to 3 to see. We'll start at verse 1. Psalm 104, verses 1 to 3. Who clothes himself with light and rides the clouds of heaven? Psalm 104, verse 1 to 3. New Testament, Jesus. Psalm, Yahweh, Jehovah. He lays the beams. Well, you got to start at verse one so we can know what you're talking about. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. That's why I said verses two to three, even though you started at three, sir. It's your mistake, but keep going. <laughs> that is my mistake. I, I'm not perfect today. Close, Stretching close. out the heavens like a tent. Um, he lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides the clouds? Yes, yes. What does Jesus, son of man, do? Rides the clouds. And Yahweh clothes himself with light as a garment? Yes. What does Jesus do? Dwells in unapproachable light. A light that when Saul saw, blinded him. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. So it's not just the Father cannot be seen in his fullness and splendor. Neither can the Son nor the Spirit. That's why the Father, Son, and the Spirit in their mercy appear in visible form in a way, in a shape that can be seen and be held. Amen. Right? Yeah. That's good. But now let's go to this one that was asked, Exodus 33, 20. This one is so misquoted, it kills me. Just open up Exodus 33 and go to 20. See? God cannot be seen. So either Jesus is not God or means the Father. That tells you why we can't be one verse Charlie's. Because if you stop at 20, yeah, you can make it say what you want. But what did God say to him, to Moses? But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. Oh, uh, see? Jesus can't be God because you saw him. Or the God that was seen has to be a son because this is the Father speaking. And you can't see the Father. Hold on. Read 18 to 23 now. Let's see the context. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name of the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That's it. Jesus can't be God or he, or it's the Father that cannot be seen because people saw Jesus. All right. Now let's keep reading. See what happens. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. How come they don't read the rest of it where God says, my back you can see, but not my face? Mm -hmm. So wait, if this is God the Father, so the Father says, you can see me. You can see my back, but not my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You caught it? Yep. How yep. come people don't read to 23, RNO? By the way, RNO, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about the other guy, Lucky. 
So how come you guys don't learn to read your Bible in context? Why do you stop at 20 where God says you cannot see my face, but do not read 23 where God says you can see my back, but not my face. So that means if this is the father, the father saying, yeah, you can see me, my back, but not my face. Mm -hmm. So even this passage is misquoted. But what does it mean to see God's back in his face? Well, what Moses was asking is to see the full splendor of God as it's displayed in heaven. In heaven, you see God displaying his splendor unmediated in front of the angels. Because that's what you read, like in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah has a vision, he sees God in a visible shape, seated on a visible throne, and the angels are worshiping. So Moses is saying, I want to see that splendor of yours. And God is saying, you can't handle it. I'll give you a glimpse. Because when I see your face, I see you as you are, <clears throat> completely unveiled. But if I see your back, I don't see you as clearly, but I still know it's you because I can recognize you from your back. So you understand what face and back mean here? I want to see the fullness of your splendor displayed in front of my eyes as it is displayed in heaven. God says, no, that I can't. You won't be able to handle it, but I'll give you a glimpse. I'll let you see my back. Speaking to God face to face is not the same as talking or Seeing God's face. So sorry. Here's the confusion again. See you guys again. Here's your confusion. Speaking to God face to face is not seeing his face. Face to face means speaking to God directly. Mouth to mouth, face to face, without any mediation. But that's not the same as seeing God's face. I can talk to you face to face, but it doesn't mean you're seeing my face because I can have a mask on and still talk to you face to face. Stop misunderstanding biblical terminology. Seeing God's face is not the same as speaking to God face to face. Speaking to God face to face means God is speaking to you directly without angelic mediation. But I can speak to God logic face to face and cover my face with a mask. But I'm still speaking to him directly face to face, but he doesn't see my face. Yeah. Everyone got it now? Let's stop misunderstanding the scriptures. Here, I'll prove to you, seeing God or speaking to God face to face doesn't mean seeing God's face. If you can, brother, go to Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20. All right. I like what Trenton said. The man who returned to Jesus Christ, who is now in love with the Trinity, in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord seal you and all of us to love Jesus Christ more perfectly forever and ever. I like what he said. Would have been better if verses and chapters were never added. So it would be harder for people to take it out of context. Yes, brother. Yeah. Deuteronomy what again? Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20. Did the Israelites see God's visible shape like Moses did? No. Read what it says there. All right. It says, And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the, the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken... We can't see your passive. That's why I'm getting confused. Can you put it up on the screen, sir, again? I love you, sir. It's up to you. If you don't want to, I can't force you. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's your world, bro. I'm a squirrel, even on my channel. I'm a squirrel. Yeah, bro, this, this, your, this, your, this your time. And the Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, what did he say? Right. Read 15 and 20. I'm sorry. 15 and 20. All right, 15. Because Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20 talks about not worshiping the constellations. 15 to 20, you're there. And if you can enlarge a little bit. All right. Jim Hellenic, these are old. If you've been watching my previous sessions over the years, I have a multi-part series on God, Father, Seen. This is stuff that I've been talking about, but we're creature repetition. Even people who've been here for years, who've heard those sessions, forgot them. So I don't know how many times I got, tell you guys, go back and rewatch and reread until it becomes second nature. So then you can recall it by the Holy Spirit because the same spirit that fills me fills you. I'm no better than you. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do what we're doing. Now watch what God said to Israel here. Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 20. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully since you saw no form on the day that Wait, the Lord. They saw no form of God. Saw no form. They only heard God's voice audibly, right? Yeah. Okay, so reread that again because I want you to catch it. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, 
since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making carved a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Now, let me break down what he's saying here. God's saying, I deliberately did not allow you to see my form, my shape, because your hearts are idol factories. You're steeped in idolatry because of Egypt. So I'm trying to cure your hearts of idolatry, making images of gods and goddesses and worshiping them. So I appeared in a cloud. You heard my voice audibly. And the sound of my voice struck fear in your hearts, but I didn't let you to see my shape like I did Moses. I'm going to show you where God let Moses see a shape. I did that to teach you, do not make images of creatures that you worship as gods and goddesses like you learned in Egypt, because I want to destroy the idolatry from your heart. So why did God not appear in visible shape to them? Because of their idolatry. So he wanted to save them from being enticed. Well, if God has an image... We can make an image of God, but then they'll be enticed to make images of gods and goddesses as well. Yeah. Okay, so I deliberately did not allow you to see my shape. So it's clear they didn't see his form, right? Right, right, right. But then explain to me Deuteronomy 5.4, because the same God says to Israel in Deuteronomy 5.4. Watch here. The Lord spake with you face to face at the mountain. Out of the midst of the fire. Okay, now you confuse me, God logic. He just said in Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 20, you did not see any form, but you heard the voice. But here it says, the Lord spoke to you face to face. Mm -hmm. So you understand face to face doesn't mean seeing God's face? Because God said to Israel, I spoke to you face to face from the cloud when you heard my voice audibly from the mount. But you didn't see my form. So, brethren, stop misinterpreting the phrase face-to-face. -face. Speaking to God face-to-face -face doesn't mean seeing God's face. It means God is speaking to you directly without any mediation. So instead of sending Gabriel, he speaks to you directly. Or instead of sending a prophet, he speaks to you directly. That's all it means. Now, not only did God speak face-to-face -to, -face to Israel, he also spoke face-to-face -face with Moses, but he allowed Moses also to see his form. Go to Numbers 12, 6 to 8. So I hope this all made sense now, brother. That answered your question thoroughly. Yeah. Did everyone get it now? Speaking to God face to face doesn't mean seeing God's face. God can speak to you directly, which is what face to face means, and still not allow you to see his glory visibly. He can allow you to hear his voice audibly. And in Numbers 12, 6 to 8, Moses spoke to God face to face and saw God's shape. Numbers 12, 6 to 8. A blessing he didn't give for the nation. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. Let me correct this mistake again. Send Antipas. You're going to make me hang myself. Because if seeing the form of God means death, then Moses didn't die. Jacob didn't die. Abraham didn't die when they saw God's visible form. Stop adding to my words and perverting scripture, St. Antipas, because I'm going to have to block you. That's not what I said. Because Moses sees God's shape and he doesn't die. Go ahead. And he said, uh, okay, verse 7. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So you see the difference? Israel speaks to God face to face, but doesn't see his form, right? Mm -hmm. Moses speaks to God face to face, mouth to mouth, and sees his form. Jamapo, you want me to block you and get you out of here? Get out of here, dude. You're not that important to say you can ask your question. Go to God's logic. He's nicer than me. But did you catch it, brother? Yeah, I caught it. I caught it. Okay, now, did did Moses see the form of God, not just speak to him face to face, mouth to mouth? Correct. Yeah, but now, so let's go to John 6, 45 to 46. Okay. 
so we can explain this as well. Exactly, was the wisdom the guy whose voice melts steel? This is the guy who's got that beautiful voice. You got it, brother. So key points is you can see the Father, but cannot be done apart from the Son. Exactly. And seeing God face to face doesn't biblically mean seeing his face, but rather speaking with no mediation, speaking directly. You got it, brother. This is why wisdom. Please go back and watch the sessions I did on whether God the Father can be seen. I did multiple sessions. I am not as short fuse as the Shia were when your mother didn't pay for muta. So get out of here, I am. All right, now, brother. Sorry, bro. Hey, man, you need bad cops so you can look better and look nicer so you can get more support than me. So I'm helping you to take off so I can be begging for food. I work for food. Go ahead. John 6, 45, 46. 45, 46. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. No, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now, seen can mean see the Father visibly or perceive the Father. Right. How do we know which definition of seen? Because the word is orao. I'm not making it up. Go to the Greek lexicon. You'll see orao means to see with the eyes or perceive with the mind, to see with the mind's eyes. When he says, not that anyone has seen the Father, only he was from God, meaning Jesus, he has seen the Father. Does he mean see him visibly or is it a deeper meaning? Perceive him and understand what he's like. Yeah. The answer is in 45. 45. It tells you see means no one has perceived, understood the Father except me. I know the Father, which is why you have to come to me for me to make him known. Because what is 45 talking about? Seeing God visibly or knowing God intimately? Yeah, because 45, it says, it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Knowledge. Yeah. Taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So that's why Jesus is saying, when the Father wants you to know him, he brings you to me. Mm. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because I alone know the Father, perceive the Father, right? Yeah. Know what he's like, and I understand him fully and completely. So who's more qualified than me to make him known? So when the Father wants to teach you who he is, and when the Father wants you to learn about his character, he sends me to your life. So the word see means to perceive and understand. Because in 45, it's all about knowing God, learning from God. It's perceiving. Oh, I see your point. And that's exactly what the word orao means in the Greek. It can mean perceive with your mind's eyes, see with your mind's eyes, or see visibly. So that's why the Father brings you to the Son. Because you cannot know or perceive what the Father's like apart from the Son. Because the Son alone knows the Father and comprehends Him fully. This is echoed in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, where it says... All things have been committed to me by my Father, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Uh, no okay. one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Yeah. And if you went to John 6, look at 46, open up, you see the word for C, click on it, you're going to see it's orao because you went to Bible Hub. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to do. I was about to do it, yeah, so you can confirm for yourself. All right, for sure. All right, so let's go ahead and do it. And you'll see it's orao, and then you'll see the lexical meaning. This is where we're misunderstanding the term see. Right? Yeah. So we are reviewing sessions I've done in depth years ago that are archived on YouTube. Brethren, we need to now go to the next step. If you're not watching or re-watching these sessions, we're going to be stuck on this level. We want to advance by the power of the Spirit to be filled so we can know God more perfectly, love Him more passionately, live for Him more faithfully. All right. So now if you enlarge it, the word see, okay? I see, look upon, experience, perceive, discern, beware, right? Now scroll down to the next the lexical service right here. Orao. 
properly see, often with metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind. Mm. I spiritually see, perceive with inward spiritual perception. Now, how do you know this is the meaning? That it means to perceive? Because he told you. All who learn from God are taught by God. See, learning, being taught, come to me. So it's about knowledge, perceiving, perception. That's right. So I hope you got your answer now. Yeah, that's clear, Sam. And now you know 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16 is about Jesus. And use the Jehovah's Witness sources to prove your point when you go run into them. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Say, hey, hey, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, Mr. Jehovah, on your uh, website, Insight Scriptures and a you say this is Jesus. Mm -hmm. How can Jesus be the only one who's immortal and dwells in unapproachable light, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, if he's a creature? Yeah. That's there you awesome. go. So, you have any other questions or you got what you needed, bro? Yeah, I got what I needed here. I appreciate That's it. That's right. You be the nice guy. You be gentle. Get all the patron subscribers where I lose support and I live in my car and panhandle. All right. Yeah, I know how that works. You're going to be seeing me with a sign in California. I work for food. I'm a broken apologist because God Avery took all my patron. God bless you and prosper us all. Amen. All right. It's gone. See you, bro. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate, man, I appreciate you. me too sometimes, but I appreciate you more. <laughs> Love you, brother. All right, brother. God bless you. All right, brother. And I hope you learned that. And we have sessions. So we got other things to talk about. Now, someone just is, is Romeo here. Romeo, come out, come out. Oh, predicator veritatis. Predicator veritatis. He said that that video of the cockroaches swarming Mecca and Medina was four years ago. But still, the fact that four years ago, cockroaches <clears throat> popped up in swarms in Mecca and Medina, what a huge embarrassment to Islam and Muhammad. All this time, I thought Muhammad is a rat. Who would have thunk that he's a cockroach? Yeah, guys, uh, if you want to share my Patreon or PayPal to the brethren, God bless them. Now, can we move on to other issues? It still happened, though, but it's four years old. I found it shared by Energetic Procession, Perry Robinson. So I assumed it was recent, but it was still four years ago. It's okay. It still happened. Whether it's four years ago, how embarrassing that Mecca Medina gets swarmed by cockroaches Showing that Muhammad is a cockroach, not just a rat. <laughs> Talk about Jesus humiliating Muslims and their fake prophet, Muhammad, who's burning in hell. You ready now? Now, do me a favor. Look at the description box. I link to my latest post. So let's go through them one at a time. Go to the description box. Click on, by the way, support our sister, Light for All Donations. Her YouTube channel gets suspended, deleted because she's doing the persecuted church a favor. She's reporting on Christians being kidnapped or murdered in Muslim lands, especially in Egypt, especially among Coptic Christians. Support this sister and her channel because she is a voice for the persecuted church. And we need to pray for the persecuted church. Christian apologist, do you want me to answer your questions and help you? Well, here, here's my link. You got to come on. Okay. So here it is. If you guys want to ask me questions, you're going to have to come online on StreamYard. If not, don't waste my time. You know what a horse is, Frank? Okay, you cockroach. You know what a hassa is? It's a pig who don't fly straight. Neither do you, Frank. Now, guys, go through the links in my description box. I posted a series of articles, and Lord willing, I'll be doing sessions on some of the articles. So when you go there, link number one, Islamic Allah, a God of death. We're going to be discussing that in this session. Islamic Allah, a God of death. I just posted it today. Cockroach. That's article number one. Okay. So we're going to be looking at that in a minute. Article number two. Article number two. The return of Yahweh God to the earth. I sh I posted this yesterday showing that the prophets all proclaimed. The prophets all announced Yahweh God Almighty himself would come to the earth, return to the earth, and live on the earth in visible form. 
I hope you're listening to me, guys. This link, I quote the Psalms, the major prophets, minor prophets, where they all announce Yahweh God visibly coming to the earth in visible shape, in visible form, to reign and judge the earth from Jerusalem. There it is. I'll be doing a session on this if the Lord wills, if he wills. Article number three. Article number three. Jesus in Islamic tradition. I took the commentary of Al-Qurtubi, and we're going to look at it today. Al-Qurtubi, and another commentary attributed to a Muslim named As-Saddi in regards to verses in the Quran about Jesus and his mother. Jesus in Islamic tradition. Lord willing, I'll do a session on that. That's article number three. And the final article, the final article, this one is a doozy. So guys, are you clicking on the links? Take my materials, upload them, translate them, snip them, study them, understand them, and share them accurately for the glory of Jesus. It's all for you. Okay? Article number four. Article number four. Here it is. This one, I can't wait to do a session on it. Article number four, Satan in the Old Testament, part two. Satan in the Old Testament, part two. People often ask, how come there aren't plentiful references of Satan in the Old Testament? Au contraire. Satan is mentioned a lot more than many people think. This is a two-part <clears throat> series. This is part two, and I link to part one in that article, where I show you all the places that Satan is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. The reason why people don't find them often is because they don't know what to look for. They mistakenly assume that they're going to find Satan under the guise of Satan or the devil, whereas there's other terms, there are other words used for the devil as confirmed by the New Testament. So there are your four articles. Use them for the glory of the Lord. Exactly. Leviathan, right? Bohemoth, Rahab, the dragon, the serpent, and Belial, Nicola. Nicola. Nicola can be a guy or a girl's name. Let me see. I guess it's a girl. Are you a girl? Because there are guys named Nicola. And you have beautiful Orthodox icon icons. Icona, icona. I hate my list. Lord Jesus, save me from Aaron mistakes and from my list. Icon, iconography. Iconography. All right. Nicola. Nicola. Oh, oh, it's Ricola. It's not Nicola. Ricola. All right. We got this guy who has questions. Let's see if he's sincere. Yes? Hi, Sam. You okay? I don't know. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I am being serious. Yeah, don't worry. So you're uh, asking me if I'm okay and you're trying to insult me and you think you're not going to get blocked? <laughs> no, I ain't going in here to insult you. I want to thank you, actually. Um, right. If it wasn't for you, I was an atheist before, about three years ago. And um, I, I was a hardcore atheist. I used to mock Christians um, for my sins. And, um, yeah, I was. I was, I was, a, I was a bad guy. Uh, I was full of sin. I was living a really bad life. And I come across some of your videos. And then I watched uh, David Wood's testimony. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> you, and you still became a Christian? That's a miracle, buddy. Yeah, man. And do you know what? Since like my life has just changed, transformed. Like it, seriously, it's everything. I've got my life. I, I was in a room before. I was getting kicked out of all these buildings. I was a full blown alcoholic. Um, I'm now three years sober and clean. Glory to the Father. Glory yeah. To Jesus Christ. Glory to the Holy Spirit. God destroyed your addiction to alcohol and transformed you, and now you love and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, fill him and seal him in your love and spirit that we Thank never, you. and he never turns away. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, it was actually one of your um, debates as well that I watched years ago. Uh, I can't remember who it was. It was with an Islamic scholar. Um, was I a little big and heavy? Yeah, you were, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 not... not, not but bigger than what you were now. But yeah, I think it was that. Uh, was it that? Not Zaki and Ike. Um, Ali. That's him. 
Yeah, should be already. Like yeah. Public debate. Imagine what I do to him now by the power. Bro, of you destroyed him, and that was <laughs> that was amazing. And that was my first public debate. All glory to Christ. Now that I'm seasoned by the power of the Holy Spirit, it, I would eviscerate him. Recall. Uh -oh. oh, I find it funny how that shake off man. He always says that um, on that one where you, David, and the other guy went to go see him. He was talking about that like, you were avoiding him and stuff like that. I've I've, I've had a good argument with him about that. What did you catch? The video where I'm destroying his jihadis right there. So he's yeah, lying. Yeah. Slob, yeah. Slob is lying. I wasn't avoiding him. No, when you weren't. Watch the video. Here's what you're going to see in the video. I say, this guy is trying to play to his fan base because he's playing the victim. That's why I walked away because he wanted to use us, three of us, to say, look at me. I took a stand for all on his messenger against the three top apologists. So I yeah. let Anthony Rogers and David Wood do their thing. Why? Because sadly, David Wood kept trying to appease <clears throat> Uthman by telling Anthony, yeah, 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 man, let him speak, man. And then <clears throat> Uthman would say, see, Anthony, even David's saying you got to chill out. That I didn't like. Now, David didn't mean anything bad about it, right? No. He didn't mean any harm. But Uthman was playing David against Anthony. Yeah. I didn't, like yeah. That. I didn't appreciate it. I was upset that Anthony was put in that position. Then later I found out. And anyway, that's another story. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yeah. So I've um obviously you know Hamza Mayat from Hamza's Den. That, that coward. Yep. Um, Tell him, hey, Sam says you're a redheaded coward, and he would spank you like uh, Muhammad spanked Aisha if you're man enough to ever come and face me. But go ahead. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I managed to get myself onto it. it he blocked me for a while, but he's unblocked me now because I I, I just kept, kept harassing him. I, I was not letting him go. I was doing shorts, reels, um, with all the most disgusting hadiths you can you can find. Um, I was just ripping him until Hold he got back. Three, one. Me. Savior, convince me you're not a spiritual prostitute and your mother is not a spiritual prostitute of the Shia. When you convince me, I'll convince you of Christianity, you filthy, vile maggot. Pit on Muhammad. Go ahead, brother. Sorry. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so I I, I was doing that. Uh, now, eventually, he's, he's agreed for me to have a debate with him. Now, on what topic? Uh, uh, the angel of the Lord. He's trying um, to tell me that the angel of the Lord quoted in the Old Testament is not Jesus. Okay. But I seem to think that it. Is. No, it is Jesus, but you can't seem to think. You have to know. And well, you, have to yeah. know that. you can't debate a topic if you're not fully confident and know how to present your case. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now there was. I wouldn't um, think debate unless I'm thoroughly prepared. Yeah. The only problem I have with him, which I'm, I'm sure you know, is this technique these Muslims use all the time. Is it the? the That's why I, I call out the dog to face me in that. See what I'll do to him. But go ahead. Yeah. They always use this technique as a bait and switch. And he he does this all the time with me. Whenever I come on the, onto his lives, he'll do this tactic about the Trinity. He'll go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Answer me this. And he'll, he'll narrow it down to one question. And he'll go, is Jesus God? And I'll Depends say, yeah. What you mean. Yeah. And then, he'll, and then he'll go back again. And then he'll say, who did Jesus pray to then? Now, when see, he... Jesus prayed to the Father. Since Father. He's not the... But then who does your God pray to? Yeah, and um, I, I've done all this, but he goes, and um, when you respond, and then you say, "Well, hang on a minute, you got double standards here, Hamza." It's the same with the Gospels. Like he was trying to get me on the Gospel writers. He was going that the Gospels were copied. Um, that he was saying that John and Luke copied from Mark. Okay, and, so and so what? Yeah, and um, he was saying that, and even then, that they weren't reliable because they weren't first-hand witnesses as well. Who told you they're not first-hand witnesses? The Quran talks about Jesus uh, 600 years after the fact, and yet it's not a first-hand <laughs> witness. So why do you believe what the Quran says about Jesus? Yeah, and also some of the hadiths are second and third. Yeah, but third. he'll say, well, the hadiths are later, but the Quran is different. I wouldn't appeal to that. They'll say, but the Quran quotes Jesus and Muhammad comes 600 years later and he's not an eyewitness and didn't interview the eyewitnesses so if that's your criterion then bury the crown down the toilet and i'll help you do it yep that, that, that's exactly what I'm, I'm open to do see the last time he, well, i did this and i managed to, i managed to catch him out and uh i embarrassed him I actually, he actually got really angered live 
to the point where he deleted the video after. See, that's um, why you can't go into the lion's den if you don't do it on your own channel and have it se se secure and archived. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, that cool. happened with me with Ijaz, that rat. We went into their channel. He didn't know I was coming. And there was a brother in the Lord named Jay Apologetics who recorded it. It was a five-hour discussion. It's on my channel. He got obliterated, buried, him and Ibn Underwear, Ibn Anwar. And yet he didn't know we were recording it. So he unleashed a 50-minute segment of the five-hour discussion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's this why is how they work, isn't it? Without lies, Islam dies. You can't go into the lions then unless you have your own live stream where you're recording it for perpetuity. But how do you want me to help you to defeat this guy? Because it's on the angel of the Lord. Right, yeah. So they, so I was wondering, because I, I missed you on um, Reason Dances the other day. I had to leave because Lloyd was coming out with these verses that were making me feel sick. i got a daughter. And um, I was getting that angry here in some of these verses that he was throwing out from the, the thicker of this. this. You come on just after I left, I think. Yeah. It was uh, about splitting the skin between a, a child's anus. Yeah, and it's, 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 yeah. Thing, it's garbage. Yeah, I, I had to leave me because, uh, like, I've got I've got a two year old girl. And yeah, just fucking it just wound me up mad. Yep. Um, but yeah, so. It's like it's, it's, it's some of the hadiths that I've got that obviously I want to use against him. But They're I'm, all I'm from the debate is on the angel of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not just on that though. He said that he wanted to get that out of the way first. He goes, we're going to talk about the angel of the Lord first. He goes, and then you can come at me with whatever okay. whatever you what you want to come at me with. Well, I've got let's... a feeling he's saying that, and then he'll just cancel me after. Yeah, the angel of the Lord. yeah. but so but what so what do you need help with, brother? Tell me, so I can help you. So I was just wondering if you've got um, any other hadiths that I might not know about. About that, what? Um, any more vile hadiths I, I can use on his on I mean, a, on his thing as an approach? The hadiths are filled and littered with vile, <clears throat> immoral, filthy actions of Muhammad. But you'd have to go on my <clears throat> YouTube channel, put in Muhammad's immorality or. Silly yeah. things are on my blog, and it's all there. Yeah, that that's what that's what I was wondering if you had anything like that so yeah, that I, I can. Much of it. Brilliant. But, yeah. All right. Well, because I, I mean, I've I've got loads, um, and I usually I, well, I always tend to use the ones from Sahih Al Bukhari and yep. Sahih Muslim because they always go to them to. Um, use... Go watch the session I did on Muhammad's silly teachings, where I quote from Bukhari. I did a session on it here for my channel, and I linked to the article. Yeah. Silly teaching Muhammad. I mean. It's all there, but what about the angel of the Lord? Uh, are, how are you going to demonstrate the angel of the Lord is God? I'm I, I'm only going to use the Bible. Let's put it that way. So, well, of course. well you can't use the Vedas. <laughs> the angel of the Lord is not in the Vedas. How are you going to prove the angel of the Lord is God? That's a tough question. <laughs> like I said, I I, 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 into a debate I need to get my folder. I need, hang on, hang on. I got my folder in my drawer. Oh, so I've, you have I've got it all written out. I've got it all written out. In a, all right. Well, then you need to come back with what you have so we can review it so I can help you. Yeah. Our Holy Spirit to sharpen your arguments because you can't go there not prepared because it's about the glory of Christ, not how many yeah. debates you've had. It's not about our reputation, it's about the glory of Christ. And we want to be our best, our utmost. Yeah, def our definitely. Soul. Definitely. Come back with your folder. We'll go through it, Lord willing. Yeah, I've or, I've already sent um like after script to Fadius anyway. You know, who? Uh, Fadius, who you spoke to the other day. Thaddeus. A reasoned oh, answer. Reasoned answers, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah. So. Yeah, but your approach has to be a little bolder. Thaddeus is a sweet brother in the Lord, but he's very soft. That yeah, approach I know. Up... He's quite a liberal uh, Christian, and he. <laughs> a liberal? What do you mean, liberal? I like kind. It, like over here, like across the pond in the UK, when we say liberal, we think about a bit more woke. Our liberal, our liberal, the liberal Democrats over here, like what we have over here, they're the, they're the le like really lefty, softy. Yes, I'm not confused. Snowflakes. I thought Thaddeus <laughs> is a conservative, Bible believing Christian. So what are you saying about him? I'm, you confuse me. Because he's quite soft, like you said. Oh, yeah, but I, we don't use liberal for that. Liberal means destructive views that are contrary to the Bible, denying. The inerrancy and historicity of the Bible. That's the wrong oh, use yeah. of for a brother. You have to say he's a little soft. Yeah, he's a little soft. Yeah, liberal, See, over, you... It's different sayings over here in England. 
<laughs> uh, it's okay. That's why you got to leave uh, England and come to the promised land, America. But get your folder before you debate. When are you going to debate him? I've got another three weeks yet. So Okay, good. So come back when you have your notes, and we're going to do a session. Yeah. We're going to fine tune them. In fact, if you actually go on my YouTube channel, are you on my yeah. YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you can't be on the phone because you can, it won't help you. You got to be on a computer. Are you on a computer? Um, I haven't. No, I haven't got that. I can. When you get on a computer, yep. Then you got to get back to me. If you're not on a computer, it's not going to work because each YouTube channel has a search engine specific to that YouTube channel where you can find videos on that YouTube channel. On the iPhone or whatever phone you have, you don't have that feature. When you use their search engine, it just shows you videos from all across YouTube. So you got to have a computer and go to my YouTube channel and there's a search engine where it's going to show you the videos on my channel and you're going to see how many videos I have on the angel of the Lord, two, three, four hour sessions on this no. topic with articles. So, but you got to come back when you're prepared with a computer and yep. your notes. So come back and let me know. Yeah, no, I will do. Definitely. Contact me on Skype. If you want to reach me. Right. Okay. That's how I'm going to know you're looking for me. Here it is. I put in the, in the private chat, Benny underscore Malik three. All right. Brilliant. That's smashing. Thank you for that. Come back so we can talk about it because I can't I help do, definitely. you. Else. I will do. Um, lastly, uh, what I was yeah. going to ask you as well. Um, I've, I've uh, obviously becoming a Christian. Um, it's been a bit of a journey for me and I've had a problem with com a couple of the denominations over here. Yeah. You're um, going to have a problem with every denomination, not just a couple. Yeah. I've re I mean, I've, I just find that Orthodox is a bit more authentic. Um, then not. Join. What's stopping yeah. you? Um, nothing. I, I am, I am going. I'm, I am waiting now for, to, you know, do do my catechism. But I just wanted to know your thoughts on the Orthodox Church. Do you, will I be saved? And my friend, you're asking me whether you're going to be saved. <laughs> what do you well, think I'm going to sit on the throne? If I, well, no. I just, uh, I'm just asking the Orthodox, your opinion. The Orthodox goes all the way back to the apostles. Yeah. Why would I tell you to go if I thought the Orthodox was corrupt? That's what I was asking. Because if you knew something that I didn't, no, like me. All I know is the Orthodox is an ancient church that goes back to the apostles, but so is the Catholic church. Now, the debate is, has the Orthodox lost its way? No. Have the Catholics lost their way? No, I don't believe that either. But they think that of the other. They're in yeah. schism, so they could attack each other. I don't get into the schism. If no. you sense that the Orthodox is authentic, then trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. He is your God. He leads yeah. you and leads me. The more you submit to the Spirit and the more you're open to his voice, the better you'll be because the Spirit will never guide you into error. I've just found a, a couple of um, apologists that are on here that have a problem with the iconography. Yeah. yeah, and those same apologists don't know their Bible because if they knew, those idiots would see that in the Scripture, God himself commission images to be used in worship like the ark of the covenant or the bronze serpent so forget about what forget about these apologists who think they know scripture there's too many people who think they know the bible and they don't that's that's got me great comfort so i've done <laughs> sessions this is why you're killing me brother you're not going on my youtube channel and searching <laughs> the series i did on veneration of saints and icons and the article i wrote on it so i'm going to help you if you're not using the search engine so come back when you have a computer I will do. I will do. And I'll uh, show you right. how to navigate, and we're going to go through the angel Lord. But contact Brilliant. me on Skype so I can know, so I can yeah, set I've it up. That. Thank right, you bro? so much. Thank you so much, Sam. Stay strong and go to the Orthodox Church. Go get chrismated. I will do. Don't delay it. I won't. God bless right, you, bro. Sam. Lord bless you. Be with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We got two more people, and we're going to go into the topic. So don't go anywhere, guys. If you're not tired, we're going to have a meat fest, if the Lord Jesus wills, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Um, excuse me. Um, I have a question about Deuteronomy 23 because it says um, basically that people people that like if their balls crushed and stuff like that. I can't hear mutilated. you. You can't hear me. Yeah. So you have a problem with people's nuts being crushed? No, I'm just curious because later on in Isaiah it says the eunuch is able to come into the yes. assembly of the Lord. Yeah, because if you read Deuteronomy 23 for how many generations? The eunuch and the Moabite, Ammonite, 
cannot enter into the congregation of God? Um, I'm not sure, actually. So you haven't read it? I have, like... Wait, so you're quoting, you're asking me about a chapter. You have not even read the entire chapter? For the Moabite dynasty, like the 10th generation. Okay. So what's your problem with it? I'm Come on, just... buddy, for the rapture. I'm going to be 100 years old by the time you get to your question. I'm 50. I can't wait till I'm 100 for you to ask your question. Yeah. I only know how to phrase it. I'm just curious to why they were excluded from the assembly. I can't hear you. I'm just curious as to why they're excluded from the assembly. The eunuchs are you talking about, or are you talking about the ones with crushed testicles? Because you mentioned something about crushed nuts. Yeah, both of them. All right, because God doesn't want them. He doesn't like them just like he doesn't like you. Is that what you want to hear? <laughs> nah. All right. That's basically it. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Sam. but anyway, coming back to the issue. If you read Deuteronomy 23 thoroughly, get back to me. We'll talk about it because you took a snippet here and there because I'm assuming you didn't get this from reading Deuteronomy 23 because you're going to answer the Lord if you're lying. Where did you get these verses from? No, I did Before get them from Deuteronomy 23, actually. Huh? I did get them from Deuteronomy 23. No, but you got it from a site that's quoting it because if you read it, then I'm baffled why you can't. Recall what's the context. Mm -hmm. All right. But anyway, here's the passage that you're talking about. He whose testicles are crushed or whose male members cut off shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay. What is that a sign of? Should I even take this right now, man? You're going to make me go off topic. I'm debating whether I should answer this now. Okay. Well, anyway, in this context, the Lord is trying to illustrate through physical blemishes because God will use physical blemishes to point to a greater spiritual reality. Someone who has testicles that are crushed or whose male member is cut off means he's childless. He cannot have seed, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a physical also deformity. So through these physical acts, physical blemishes, physical imperfections, God is pointing to a greater spiritual reality. That unless you are perfect and unblemished, you cannot stand in the presence of God. So it's not showing hatred for them or he's looking down on them. He's using this to illustrate a greater spiritual truth. And what is that greater spiritual truth? Without holiness, without being morally unblemished, you cannot remain in the presence of God. So this is a way of communicating to Israel through physical defects, the need for absolute moral perfection. And it's not just in Deuteronomy 23. If you go to Leviticus 21, there you're going to see that God says in Deuteronomy, Leviticus 21 that you cannot bring a blemished animal as a sacrifice. Or if a priest has a physical deformity, like he has one crushed testicle, or one leg shorter than the other, any defect, he's disqualified from serving. Mm -hmm. Why? Not because God hates physical deformities. It's because to illustrate through physical deformities that you cannot be spiritually deformed, spiritually blemished, and remain in the presence of God. It's meant to point to a greater spiritual reality, the need for absolute moral perfection, purity, and they have to be unblemished before God. Oh, I see. To show you that God doesn't discriminate, then you went to Isaiah 55, right? Not yeah. Isaiah 50, I'm sorry. Isaiah 56, where God says, the eunuch will have a place in my temple. Okay? Yeah. It's much Wait. deeper than that. I need to do a session on it because the problem is I'm going to go off topic. So I'm going to try to do a session just because you brought it up. Can I ask what one I'm more saying? session? I mean, can I ask one more question, please? That depends, man. If you make me change the subject, I'm going to send you to Mecca. Go ahead. It's a more serious one. So I was watching um your stream from two years ago that you did on Jewish believers, mm -hmm. and I'm just asking why do Jewish believers have to um keep on doing the ceremonies of the Sabbaths and the moon? Well, well I'm gonna call Paul and Peter and ask them. You want me to call because I have a direct line to to heaven. <laughs> no, I mean I can call them. Hold on, let one guys. Let me call them. So he's saying why did they have to keep them? I was quoting Acts chapter 15, Acts 21, and Acts 24. Showing you in Acts chapter 3 and Acts 10 
that the Jews, who are ethnic Jews, still kept Sabbath, went to the temple to pray, and observed morning and evening sacrifices, and got circumcised. And you ask me why they did that, because they're ethnic Jews, and to show their faithfulness and fidelity to the God who spoke to Moses, they kept doing those commands that Gentiles were not required to do, because those commands is what distinguish Israel from the nations. But let me call and ask Paul, Ken, or Peter, who do you want me to talk to, Peter or Paul? Paul. All right, hold on. One second. Hold on, brother. It's, I think it's kind of busy. They got a lot of calls today. Something happening in the Middle East? Oh, yeah, the cockroaches spreading in Mecca and Medina. So that got the line booked. Hey, hey, hello, hey. Hi, where are you? Hey, Baruch Hashem. Shalom, Kavanim. Oh, why am I speaking Hebrew? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I tried that last time. You told me Hebrew is not the heavenly language. It's Assyrian. My apologies. So who am I talking to? Who? Abaddon, Apollyon, hold on, buddy. Aren't you that angel who's given authority over the abyss and your name means destroyer? Why would you be picking up the phone, dude? Oh, you haven't come down to heaven yet. I mean, from heaven to the earth. All right, good to know. Anyway, uh, is Paul there? Which Paul? Paul the apostle, man. Dude, no wonder they call you destroyer. You just destroyed a few more of my brain cells. Hold on, buddy. Yeah, Paul, the apostle. Oh, he's busy. Why? Oh, he's out fishing. With who? Oh, with Peter. How long will they be <laughs> occupied? You mean I can't reach them for two weeks? All right, Abaddon. You're the man. Sorry. Thank you. Dude, sucks being you. I won't be able to talk to them for at least two weeks. So come back in two weeks, and then I'll get you, I'll get you to talk to them on the phone with me, all right? All right. All right, buddy. Thank you, Sam. I'll do something on Deuteronomy 23 in the near future, brother. Take care. Thank you. Love you, man. Malachi. Truthy. Why is it truthy? Is it truth or truthy? It's truth. That's my actual last name. Oh, so your last name is spelled truth with an E? Yeah. It resembles the Quran with all its grammatical ambiguities. I didn't know <laughs> truth had an E. But I'll do a session on it, God willing. I'll go in depth in the near future because I want to finish this topic. Okay, right, friend? All right. Shalom Khaveri, what nationality are you, by the way, before I send you back to Asheron? I'm Jamaican and Guyanese. Come back to Jamaica. Wait, uh, so you're partly Jamaican, what else? And Guyanese. Well, I don't know. Guyanese. From Ghana? No, South America. South America, there's a place called Gaia, Guyanese in South America? Guyana, yeah. Guyana, oh, so that's what I said. Ghana, it's pronounced Guyana or Ghana? Guyana. Guyana. Like Diana? Dirty Diana. No. Yeah. Diana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Malachi? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Anyway, Lord willing, I'll announce when I do Deuteronomy 23. Hopefully, maybe in the upcoming days or week. Come back to Jamaica. Sing with me. It's about your country. What's old is what's new. Come on. I don't know the lyrics. What? I don't know, I don't know the lyrics to it. Well, repeat after me, dude. Don't you know how to repeat? Paul, you want a cracker? Come back to Jamaica. Come back to Jamaica. Say like you mean it, dude. Don't be ashamed of your people. Come what's back to Jamaica. Something was new. Yes, you'll never make it as a singer. And it's <laughs> not being you. Okay, man. Reply me, man. Why like this? God bless you, young man. Stay strong. And I'll do a session on Deuteronomy 23. All right. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take care, buddy. You can't sing sucks being you. Now, I'm here. Jesus is king. Your can, device is not connected, so I can't help you, buddy. All right. Let's not finish the rest of this. Oh, now it's connected. All right. So here's a guy pretending to be a Christian. He's not. Yeah? Can I help you? <laughs> this year. Uh, God bless. How are you, man? Okay. So say, okay, you're not, you don't sound like that a troll. Go ahead. What's up, buddy? King James only. No, I, I just I have a I have a Persian background, so that's why I'm. Oh name man, is in here. the office, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I just wanted to ask, how can I? How can uh, I, prove? How can I prove that the Quran is not perfectly preserved? Like, what's the best? You got. You got to go to their own hadiths. The hadiths say that there were variant mm -hmm. Qurans 
that were not uniform and contradicted one another, which required Uthman to then burn them and standardize one Quran. So what you got to do is right. you got to run the sources. So if you go to my blog or Answering Islam, here, let me get you the link. Let me make it easier. That's okay. the only way you can do it. I mean, apart from even the existing manuscripts of the Quran, no two copies of the Quran are exactly identical. And that's to be expected when things are hand copied. Copyists will make mistakes. But their sources teach that when Muhammad's companions wrote down the Qurans, their Qurans did not agree. They contradicted one another and almost led to civil war where the Muslims were going to kill each other because of differences. So Uthman then destroyed the other Qurans and he standardized one that he thought was the most authentic. And then you had yeah. Muslims like Abdullah bin Masood who did not accept. He goes, no, that Quran by Zayd is not more authentic than mine. And it led to civil strife. And then on top of that, they will admit to you that Uthman's Quran has at least 14 different Arabic versions of it called Qiraat. They'll admit it. They'll go, oh, but these are all acceptable. Yeah, in your mind, it's acceptable. Here, let me get you the link. Right. right they say that they say there's only one Quran. Meanwhile, yeah, there's actually the, more than so notice 14 yeah, there's different, different variations. Arabic versions of the Quran is one. So they make make fun of us when we say three and one, but they have 14 and one. Right. So, <laughs> so if you see in the private chat, I just sent you the link. You see the link? Yeah, I see the link. Okay, I'm on my phone, so I can't I can't click it right it? now, but I'll, no, I'll, but you I'll got click it, right? on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you go there. We have a slew of <clears throat> articles quoting the hadiths, Muslim sources, that admit there are missing verses, missing chapters. The Qurans contradict one another, almost led to civil strife. And then Uthman had to burn the Qurans, written down by Muhammad's companions, that they learned from Muhammad from memory, showing memory did not preserve it. Right. So there, and there another another thing, another thing they'll bring up is how you know the Quran is memorized, so it can't be, you okay, know, even you if you mind? erase all the Qurans. Amir, then did you pretend you just heard me. What did I just say? <laughs> what did I just say? Oh. Uh, yeah. No. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Real quickly, because I got to go to my topic. Yo, what's up, Sam? Salam alaikum. Salam, huh? Salam, Salam. Salam. How are you? How are you? What is it? How are you? How are you I don't know what you said. You said salam alaikum. What did you say? Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, yes. Salam alaikum. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> now nah, I'm just playing with you. But um, how do I prove that the Bible is perfectly preserved, my Muslim friends? Hello? Theo, I'm going to give you a minute to leave my channel and go find your answers on my YouTube or my blog, something I've answered 10 million times. <laughs> okay, okay. What do you need, buddy? Wife, Peter. Say again, what was it? Wife, Peter. Your mother's a whore? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. Okay, brethren, we ready? Guys, don't insult my intelligence and come up here and ask me questions that I've answered. Stop being lazy because I'm going to block all you guys. Stop being lazy. Don't be a lazy bum that you can't go on the YouTube or on my blog and find the answers. I'm going to start blocking you and never letting you come back to my channel ever again. Okay? It's disgusting how lazy Christians are. They ask the same question that we've answered 10 billion times. Anyway. That was Mahmoud Nus Khan, whose mother's a Shia whore, whose uncle sodomized him, who beats little children for a living like his bastard Muhammad is burning in hell. So he's blaming me for Muhammad did Aisha, beat her like a dog. So now with that said, brethren, let's get to the topic. Let's get to the topic. You got, brethren, you see that guy, the guy who said he's Persian? Did he even hear what I said? You see? Did he even hear what I said? I said... Uthman burned Qurans that were written by Muhammad's companions that they learned directly from Muhammad, proving that memory failed to preserve the Quran. Oh, how do I refute the Muslim when he says the Quran is preserved by memorization? You see what an insult? I, you, did you hear my answer? I just answered that. The companions of Muhammad wrote down Quran that they learned from Muhammad and memorized. And when they wrote down what they learned from memory, they were contradicting one another, leading to civil strife, where Uthman had to then burn their Qurans. Oh, how do I refute? How do I refute? The Quran was memorized. <laughs> how do I refute? 
All right, let's go into the topic. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. Let's talk about Allah as the God of death. You want more proof that Allah of Islam is not the true God? Well, it's in my latest post. What's my latest post? Let me get you the link. We're going to talk about it here. In my latest post, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let's go. Brisco, let's go, let's go. David Telesco, let's go, let's go. Oh, David Telesco. Watch here how you can prove from the Quran that the God of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. Here it is. Let me, it's in the description box. Let's do this. They're here. Islamic Allah, a God of death. You ready to learn now? You ready to learn? No more wasting time. Ask Holy Spirit to help you to stay focused. Here it is. Let's begin. According to the Quran, Allah, the God of the Quran, created death and life. Created death and life. Now you're going to get blown away, guys. Get ready to get shocked. May the Lord Jesus bless our numbers for the glory of the Father, Holy Spirit, not for my praise. May he give you perfect attentiveness and anoint my mouth to speak perfectly accurately for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the one true God. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically. And do that for our loved ones. Do that for my daughters, their mother, Michelle. In Jesus' name, rebuke Satan and cover us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. Chapter 67, verses 1 to 2. The God of the Quran creates death and life. Chapter 67, verses 1 to 2. Blessed is he in whose hand is a dominion. Blessed is he in whose hand is a dominion. And he is able to do all things, who has created death and life. This shows you that Allah the Quran is Satan. Allah of the Quran is Satan. Okay? That he may test you, which of you is best indeed. And he is the Almighty, the oft forgiving. It's all in my article, guys. It's in the description box. Chapter 67, verses 1 to 2. Why do I say this proves that Allah of the Quran is Satan? Notice it says... Allah created death. Okay. Allah created death. Are you listening? Why don't you guys pay attention? Now you're going to see how this proves that Muhammad's God is Satan. Are you ready? Let me now shock you with another detail. In the Bible, what was the tree? That God told Adam he could not eat therefrom. Pay attention, brethren. Help me help you stay focused. Don't engage other people. What was the tree that God said Adam could not eat from? What was the tree? Come on, brother. Yeah. Now, did God tell them do not eat from the tree of life initially? No, right? If you read Genesis 2, 15 to 17... God said you can eat of all the trees, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat. Meaning they could even eat the tree of life. It was only after they sinned and were expelled from the garden, they were banished from eating from the tree of life, right? Right? Now here's where you're going to get shocked. Brethren, you're going to get blown away. Are you listening? In Jesus' name, listen. Let the Holy Spirit be the teacher working through me. Focus on him, for he is worthy. The Lord Jesus Christ, give us the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Let me now show you what's shocking. Did you know the Quran says the tree that Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat from was the tree of life? The Quran says Adam and Eve were forbidden from eating from the tree of life. The Quran does not know of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Quran says that Adam and Eve were forbidden from eating the tree of immortality, the tree of eternity, the tree of life. It has no idea about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you know that? Let me prove it to you. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 25 of the Quran. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 25. Here you go. Watch here. Let me break it down for you. And I'm going to break down the implication. Here it is. Read with me. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 25. Then Shaitan, 
Satan whispered suggestion to them both in order to uncover that which was hidden from them of their private parts before. He said, your Lord did not forbid you this tree, save you should become angels or become of the immortals. You're going to see what the tree is in a minute. So your Lord forbade you from eating the tree to make you immortal, make you like angels. The Quran has no knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It assumes the forbidden tree is a tree of life, immortality. And I'll prove it from quoting chapter 20 of the Quran, but work with me. And he swore by Allah to them, verily, I am one of the sincere well-wishers for you both. So he misled them with deceit, deception. Then when they tasted of the tree, that which was hidden from them of their shame, private parts, became manifest to them. And they began to stick together the leaves of paradise over themselves in order to cover their shame. And their Lord called out to them saying, right? So let me quote the rest of it. Watch. And chapter 20 is going to be even clearer that it's the tree of life, the tree of immortality, right? The tree of life, the tree of immortality. Watch here. Pay attention, brethren. Don't distract each other. Did I not forbid you that tree? So notice Allah agrees. He agrees with Satan. That's the tree I forbade you to eat. And tell you verily, Shaitan is an open enemy unto you. They said, Our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If we, if you forgive us not and bestow not upon us your mercy, we shall certainly be of the losers. Allah said, Get down, one of you, an enemy to the other. Adam, Hawa, and Shaitan. On earth will be a dwelling place for you and an enjoyment for a time. He said, therein you shall live, and therein you shall die, and from it you shall be brought out, are you resurrected? Now, guys, if you're not paying attention, you're not going to learn. Okay. Do you see that the tree that Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat was the tree of life, making them immortal, like angels, to live forever? And secondly, do you see that they were in paradise, and their punishment wasn't death? Their punishment was to be thrown out of paradise. In other words, the Quran doesn't say the punishment for their sin was death because Allah had already created them to die, which is why they were not allowed to eat of the tree of immortality. So what was their punishment for sin? Being thrown out of paradise to the earth to die there instead of in paradise. Did you catch it? Because I have to quote another one to reinforce this point. You guys caught it or no? Exactly, Jameson, you caught it. And I'm going to prove it from the next surah. Right? The Quran assumes Jannah, Jannat al Adan, is in heaven. Adam and Eve were in heaven. So their punishment for sin wasn't death because Allah already created death, which is why they could not eat of the tree of immortality because He didn't want them to live forever, He wanted them to die. So their punishment for eating from the tree of life was they were expelled to the earth. Now let me prove it from the second surah. Pay attention and don't be distracted. This is chapter 20, verses 120 to 124. If that wasn't clear, there you go. Here it is. You can, don't get any clearer than this. Space ghost. Pay attention, brother. They were not fallen angels. They were humans. Chapter 20, verses 120, 124. Pay attention. Then Shaitan whispered to him, saying, O Adam, shall I lead you to the tree of eternity? There it is, black and white. Lest you think I was misquoting chapter 7. Shall I lead you to the tree of eternity and to a kingdom that will never waste away? Then they both ate of the tree. You see what their sin was? They ate of the tree of eternity. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so their private parts appeared to them and they began to stick on themselves the leaves from paradise for their covering. Watch here now. Watch what's going to happen. And the contrast with the true God. And you're going to appreciate the God of the Bible and you're going to see why Allah the Quran is Satan. Let's read the rest of it. Then did 
Adam disobey his Lord and he went astray. Then his Lord chose him and turned to him with forgiveness and gave him guidance. Now watch what the punishment was. Allah said, get you down, go down from the paradise to the earth. Both of you, you and Hawa, together, some of you are an enemy to some others. Then if there comes to you, to you guidance from me, then whoever follows my guidance shall neither go astray nor fall into distress and misery. Uh-oh. And then the last part of it. And then we're going to contrast it with God's word, the Holy Bible. I'm going to show you what God's word, the Holy Bible says. But whoever turns away from my reminder, i.e., neither believes in the in the Quran nor acts on its orders, etc. Verily, for him is a life of hardship, and we shall raise him up blind on the day of resurrection. Okay. Do you see that according to the Quran, if you're paying attention, Adam and Eve were in paradise, in heaven, paradise. Janat al Adam was in heaven. Adam and Eve were forbidden from eating of the tree of eternity, meaning the tree of life. And their sin was they ate of the tree of eternity, tree of life. And their punishment wasn't death because they already created to die. Their punishment was they were thrown out of paradise to the earth. Exactly, wisdom. Do you see the fingerprints of Satan taking the truth of the Bible, perverting it? Perverting the true message of God's word through Muhammad and deceiving people? Michael, you got it. If you understood what I just quoted, then you'd get it like Michael. In other words, the God of the Quran wanted humanity to die from the get-go. He wanted human beings to die. He didn't create them to live forever. Alan Syke, pay attention, please. But according to our Bible, Satan brought death into the world by tempting Adam and Eve to sin because the punishment for sin is death, proving that the God of the Bible did not create you to die. Let me prove that now by going to God's word. Are you ready? Here it is, the link again to the article. Everyone getting it? Pay attention, brethren. Don't engage one another so you can learn. Now let's look at the God of the Bible. Did the God of the Bible create death? Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Watch here. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Watch here. Exactly, Lepanto. Such a satanic pagan religion. See, the more you study the Quran, the more you see how evil it is, how filthy it is, how wicked it is, how satanic it is. It's from the pit of hell. And that truly the Quran was inspired by Satan to oppose God's word, the Bible. Turning things on their head. Can I watch? What does God's word say? Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Do not invite death by the error of your life. See, death comes upon you by your sin, by your evil deeds, nor bring on destruction by the works of your hands. Why? Because God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. You see the beautiful difference between our God and Allah of the Quran? You see right there? Because God did not make death. He does not delight in the death of the living. Why? For he created all things, everything he created to live, that they might exist. And the generated forces of the world are wholesome. He created the world to be good and wholesome. There is no destructive poison in them. So where did it come from? Your sin, your rebellion. And the dominion of Hades is not on earth. Hades, death does not reign on earth, for righteousness is immortal. So then how did sin come into the world? But ungodly men, by their words and deeds, summoned death. Considering him, meaning that death is being personified as a person, a friend, they pined away and they made a covenant with him, death, by sinning, because they are fit to belong to his party. Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. You see the difference? Now watch. How did 
Adam and Eve bring death by sinning. Why did they sin? Because Satan, out of envy, tempted them to sin. Here it is, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. It's all in my article, guys. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 23 to 24. So Satan, out of his envy for mankind, hatred of mankind, tempted them to sin. So by tempting them, he's responsible for death because they succumbed to temptation, sinned, and died. Watch. Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 2, verse 23 to 24. And I'm going to quote to you the proto-canonical books. Because I know a lot of Protestants reject the deuterocanonicals. But I'm going to show you the deuterocanonicals perfectly with the proto-canonical writings. Because they are inspired. And I thank the Lord that he awakened me to the inspiration of the deuterocanonicals. Pay attention, brethren. Don't engage each other. Stay focused so you can learn. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 23 to 24. For God created man for incorruption. Wait, did God create you to die, to corrupt, to decay? No, he created you for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. So he created you to reflect his image of living immortally. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world and those who belong to his party experience it. So you see the difference between the God of the Bible? He did not make death. He did not bring in corruption. Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin. And through sin and evil, we brought death and corruption into the world. Okay? But now let's look at the proto-canonical books. Do the proto-canonical books agree? Oh, yeah. Let's see. It's all in my articles. Romans 5, 12 to 14. How did death enter the world? Romans 5, 12 to 14. Here it goes. And then we're going to look at Genesis. Therefore, Romans 5, 12 to 14. As sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sin. So how did death come into the world? Through sin. How did sin come into the world? Through Adam's disobedience. Because according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is to break the command of God, the law of God. So when God gave them a law, a command, don't eat, and they ate, they sinned. And when they sinned, their punishment was death. So they only died when they sinned because God didn't create them to die. Romans 5, 12 to 14, Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sin. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, meaning before the law of Moses was revealed, because people had the law written in their hearts, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death can counted, right? Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even before the law was revealed miraculously, the way God revealed through Moses, people were still dying because they were still sinning, even though they may not have been aware of it. Because once sin entered the world, it brought decay and corruption and physical death. Even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. All right. Hold on. Let's look at other things. Okay. Let me show you what God says. Who brought death into the world? Adam and Eve. But at whose instigation? The devil. The devil. Now, I don't know why I didn't quote Hebrews 2 here. Man, my goodness. Oh, yeah, here it is. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. These are the proto-canonical books. Protestants even accept the, these, so they can't say, well, that was apocrypha. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Pay attention, brethren. Since, I hate when I leave out a word. Hold on. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has power of death, that is the devil. Did you catch it? Who has authority over death? The devil. Why? Because when he tempted Adam and Eve to sin, by tempting them to sin, they brought death, giving him now authority, jurisdiction over them. Because when you sin, you authorize the devil. To bring charges against you, 
thereby bringing you under God's condemnation. So sin gives the devil authority over you to accuse you before God, the just judge, to then condemn you to die. You getting it? That through death he might destroy him who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. See, you got it. Wow, Allah sounds like the devil because if Allah created death, but it is Satan who brought death into the world by tempting Adam and Eve to sin and breaking God's law. And the punishment for sin <clears throat> is death. You just proved all of the Quran is Satan. You got it? You guys got it right here? Because when you sin, and what is sin? First John 3, 4, breaking God's command. The punishment of sin is death. Here it is. The punishment of sin is death. Why didn't I put Romans 6.23? Oh, boy. See, again, another passage I forgot. Yep. All right, anyway. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.20. The soul that sins shall die. Ezekiel 18.4. The soul that sins shall die. Let me post it for you so you can see it. Ezekiel 18.4. The soul that sins shall die. Ezekiel 18.20. Ezekiel 18.4. Ezekiel 18.20. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul that sins shall die. The soul that sins shall die. And what was the punishment for eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Death, which means God did not create Adam and Eve to die. Here it is. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. God said, if you eat, you will die. You don't eat, you won't die. Because he didn't create them to die. Here it is. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Everyone getting this? Is the point being made? The difference between Allah the Quran and the God of the Bible? Here it is. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life. They didn't need to have to eat of the tree of life, even though they could freely eat it, because he created them to live immortally. So they could eat of it. But in reality, they were created not to die. So they could eat of it, but still, they weren't created to die. They would only die when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because that would be breaking the command, and sin is breaking the command, and the punishment of sin is death. Lord willing, in a future session, I'll unplack what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. I may do it right now, too, so you understand what is that. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So are you seeing that the God of the Bible did not create Adam and Eve to die? But he warned them, if you break my command, then that is sin, because sin is breaking God's law, his command. And the punishment of your sin will be death. Now, what does the tree of the knowledge and good and evil represent? Let me give you a quick nutshell, trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate me, to speak clearly without error, for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. Why did the Lord say, do not eat the tree of knowledge, good and evil? And why did God place it there? Do you want me to go a little in-depth? Because I'll do a session on this, trying to tread lightly so I don't make any mistakes. Trusting the Spirit, our teacher, to guard my tongue from error. Okay, let me explain what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represent. No, David Goldfield, because eating of the tree of life meant nothing for Allah because he can still kill you dead because Allah has power over everything, David Goldfield. All right. 
God gave them choice. Now, this is why Calvinism sucks and it's not biblical. God has shown us from Scripture for true loving relationships to exist, persons must be able to choose whether they want to enter that relationship or not. <clears throat> so you want me to go a little deep here? Why God brought me out of Calvinism? Because Calvinism doesn't make sense of Scripture. <clears throat> if you believe everything's pre-programmed. The Bible is clear. Love is reciprocal. But reciprocal love will not exist unless you can choose not to reciprocate. Now, follow with me, brethren. Please listen carefully because I got to go in depth and go slowly, trusting the Spirit to illuminate me to help you understand. So the Lord knew if the love between the creatures and I is to be true and reciprocal, then creatures <clears throat> must be given an ability to respond to that love or reject it. Okay, follow me. Respond to the love or reject it. Because if you were programmed to love God without having the ability to reject that love, then it's not genuine love because you are nothing but robots programmed to think that you're making a choice when in reality you're not. Well, couldn't God simply create you in such a way that you're thinking you're making a choice when in reality you're not because you're programmed to choose to love God and you couldn't choose contrarily? He could have done that, but then he'd be a deceiver. Why? Let me explain why. God is a God of truth. God is faithful to his own character. So if God had done that, then God would have known he was deceiving mankind into thinking they're making a choice when he knew they were not making a choice. They were simply responding to the way he designed them. So God would have been unfaithful to himself and God would have been acting contrary to his own nature. And that's something God cannot do because God cannot deny himself. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.13. So because God is faithful to himself and faithful to who he is and cannot act contrary to his nature and cannot act corruptly or deceitfully, he couldn't then create you with the impression that you're making a choice even though you're programmed to only choose to love him. Because God would know he was deceiving you and acting contrarily to his nature. And that would mean he was going against his character and denying himself, something that 2 Timothy 2.13 says God cannot do. Everyone want me there? You understand why God could not have created you in such a way where you would be programmed into thinking you're making a choice, but he designed you that the only choice you could make is to love him and then leave you with the impression you're choosing to love him because then he'd be acting in deceit and deception and God is faithful to his own nature and cannot act contrarily to his own nature and prove faithless to his own character, 2 Timothy 2.13. Christian apologists, let me know when you want me to block you for asking a relevant question. Everyone got it? So that means God had one of two choices, not to create creatures to reciprocate or to create creatures who would reciprocate and know that they would choose contrarily and bring destruction and pain and misery. Okay, everyone got that before I move on? I can't go super in-depth. I'm just trying to go deep enough where you understand why God could not have created you with the impression that you're choosing to love God, even though you're programmed to think you're making a choice, when in reality, you couldn't choose contrarily because God would be dishonest to himself, disowning himself, denying his character. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.13, God cannot deny who he is. He cannot act contrarily to his nature. He cannot be faithless to his own character, to his own nature. Is that point clear?
Is that point clear before I move on to the next point? What the tree of the knowledge of good and evil serve, the purpose it served? Let me see if my cat needs to get in. Please let me know, guys, and please pay attention. I'm trying to speak as accurately, trusting the Spirit to enable me to be faithful to Scripture so we can know the beauty of this book, the beauty of the God who authored this book. May I not be too loud or distracting to my neighbors. Let me see if my cat needs to come in. Because I want to take it as next step. My cat there? Oh, there it goes. Okay. You can play with him if you want. So just be careful with baby. And Jesus is saying, hold on tight to that baby. Kitty. Yeah, her name's Kitty if you guys want to play it. Let me try to see about the next kid. Alright, get me! Okay, you ready? Come on, kid. All right. All right, guys. Now, let's continue. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented the issue of trust. Let me explain what the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents. The issue of trust. The tree of knowledge of good and evil represented one of two choices. Will you trust me to tell you what is right or wrong? Because you know my character. You know that I want the best for you and I love you, okay? That I want the best for you and I love you. Are you going to trust me to decide and tell you what's right or wrong? Or will you take matters into your own hands and decide what is right, right or wrong on your own initiative based on your own limited wisdom? That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented, the issue of trust. Will you trust me to tell you what's right or wrong and tell you what's best for you and what's not good for you? Because you know I'm your heavenly father who loves you and wants the best for you. And here's the proof. Look at the world I created. Look at the garden I created. Look at all the trees. Look at all the fruits. Look at its beauty. Look how beautiful I made you. What more proof do you want? I have your best interest. And I love you and I want what's best for you. I gave you a world <clears throat> filled with beauty, glory, filled with fruits and vegetables that you can eat to your heart's desire. What more could I do to show you that I love you from the depth of my being and I want the best for you and I know what's best for you, so will you trust me? So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was an issue of trust. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to question me and my wisdom and my character, doubting whether I have your best interest and deciding for yourselves what's good or bad because you think you know better and know more than me? That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented. You understand? And we are all Adam, Adams and Eves because we repeat the same mistake because we decide to take matters into our own hands, going with our own wisdom, doing things according to our own understanding, knowing that the things we're doing goes against God's will, and then suffering the consequences and learning the hard way we were wrong and God was right after all. Right? So when God says, no sex before marriage, because I know what's best for you, and it's not good for you to be sexually active, because the more sex you have, the harder it will be for you to commit to anyone, making it much more probable for you to just leave someone. This is why we have about a 60% divorce rate and dysfunctional families. So will you trust me, though? No, God, I won't trust you. I'll take matters into my own hands. Because I think I know better than you, and I think I know what's best for me, not you. And that's why we're in the hell that we are in today. Do you understand what the... See, when you see what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, it breaks your heart, and like some of you, moves you to tears with what the tree truly represented. Trusting God or not. This is why the serpent said... God knows in the day that you eat of it, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you understand what I meant? 
You won't need God to tell you what's good and evil because like God, you're going to know what's good for you and what's bad for you. So you don't need him to tell you. That was the test. This is amazing or what? You got you guys going to make me cry. Like living like human says, I'm sorry, Lord, have mercy. You guys going to move me in my spirit. Yeah, even Miss G, you're going to make me cry. Your reactions, guy, you're going to make me cry, guys. <clears throat> so when you see it from that perspective, when they ate of the tree, you know what they told God? We don't trust you because we don't think you have our best interest and you know what's good for us. We'll do it our way because we don't have enough trust in you. In other words, this was an attack on God's goodness and it was a sin that broke his heart. That's what it was. You understand? And I'm still guilty of it every day when I take matters into my own hands. Yep, Charles, you're going to make me cry too. In other words, when they ate of the tree, you know what they told God? Honestly, this is what this story is. They told God, God, we don't trust your character. We don't trust your goodness. We don't trust that you have our best interest. We think we can do it better than you and that we're wise enough to know what's good and bad on our own. Breaking God's heart. <clears throat> and now notice the assault against God. It's going to get worse. Adam and Eve listened to the voice of a stranger, someone they did not know, and took his word over the God whom they knew. In other words, God created them with perfect bodies, flawlessly beautiful, created a beautiful earth with no defects, put them in the most beautiful garden imaginable, gave them trees and fruits and vegetables so they can eat to their satisfaction. And all that God did, and even showing how much he loved man when he said, man is not good for him to be alone. I love him so much, I'm going to create a helper proving his love. And instead of trusting him, instead of seeing all he did for them and taking him at his word, they listened to the voice of a stranger and allowed a stranger to cause them to doubt the one who had proven his love for them over the whispering of someone they did not know. And we do that till this day. We will entertain the whisperings of a stranger to call into question the fidelity and love of someone that has been nothing but good to us, questioning the goodness of a person who has proven himself or herself over the gossip of someone that we hardly know. Isn't that true? We are doing it till this day. Till this day, we're doing it. When someone who's a best friend you spent your life with and done everything to show your love and fidelity, and then a stranger comes and whispers in the ear of your friend, and he starts questioning your integrity and starts <clears throat> doubting whether you truly love him or her, that rips our heart from our chest. That's what Adam and Eve did to their God. So Adam... Here's the choice. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a choice. Will you trust me in telling you what's best for you? Because I love you and I've proven my love to you. And that I want nothing but good for you. Romans 8, 28. Are you going to doubt my goodness and my love for you? And decide what's right or wrong <clears throat> on your own independently from me. The choice is yours. And sadly, Adam and Eve told God, Lord, we don't have enough faith in you and trust in you that you have our best interests in mind. And what is God's response? After all I did, after all I created, making you the crown of my creation, making you the ruler of all the works of my hands, making angels subject to you, putting you in a beautiful garden beyond Words, words cannot describe. Giving you everything you could possibly want to eat and more. All I did, and you still doubted me? You still questioned my goodness and my love for you? 
That's what the tree of the knowledge and good and evil represented. You understand? It was a direct assault against the character and the faithfulness of God. That's what it represents. Now, I hope you see how deep the story is. From your reaction, I can see that many of you haven't had this particular section of Genesis unpacked. And glory to the Holy Spirit with the wisdom he gives us to illuminate us to find the meat and what the real message is. Man calling into question God's goodness and love for him. Calling into question God's character. Saying, God, I don't trust you enough to take your word. And saying, you know what's best for me because I don't really think you have my best interest. You're jealous that I'll be like you, knowing good and evil, so I won't need you to tell me how to run my life. And they fell for it. <clears throat> they fell for it. You understand? So that's what the serpent did. You really think this God is dependable, reliable? You really think he's out for your best interest? No, he's scared. Now read it with that. He knows in the day that you eat of it, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. He's scared. He doesn't want you to know good and evil to decide for yourselves. He wants to keep you as slaves under his control like a dictator. He doesn't care for you. He's afraid. That you're going to realize you don't need him. And you can make your own choices and live your own life independently from him, which was a lie from the pit of hell. He gave them everything. He even gave them himself. And watch how loving and beautiful God is. If you read the Genesis account, God did not always show up visibly. He would show up visibly here and there, fellowship with them, love them, and then leave. Do you know why? Exactly, Trenton. I love you, young man. You are coming to the fullness of the truth. May the Lord seal you and all of us. Brilliant words, my young man. And Allah wants submission, Trenton. Do you guys know why the Lord would not appear visibly all day, all night? Do you know why? Watch the goodness of God. You want to fall in love with God even more? See how beautiful the God of the Bible is? He would appear visibly, have fellowship with them, love them, and disappear. You got it, wisdom. Because he wanted Adam and Eve to have alone time to grow, to love each other, and depend on each other, and become inseparable. He wanted to give them time alone to grow with each other and become inseparable. So I'm going to give you some alone time, Adam. I'm going to give you some alone time, Eve. Enjoy each other and grow to become attached to each other. Because that's what I want for you. And in spite of all he did, they still question his goodness. What more did you do you want from me? Yeah, <clears throat> it is. It is. This is the oldest love story. The original love story of a God whose beloved broke his heart because his beloved doubted his goodness. What more could I have done for you, Adam? What more could I have done for you, Eve? What more could I have done to prove to you how much I love you? Exactly, Flying Fish, you're getting it. In fact, I'm even going to the extra step. I'm now going to go the extra mile, showing you how much I love you. I will become flesh and die that accursed death you deserve to save you from death, to show you my perfect love for you. What more now? I became flesh from your flesh through the virgin, and I died the death you deserve to pay your debt so you can be forgiven and live in my presence. Do you require anything else of me? I even went to the point of becoming human to die a miserable human death. I took on another nature. 
the nature of humanity. So I can be one of your sons, Adam, one of your sons, Eve, so I can die this accursed human death to pay your debt. What more could I do to show you my infinite love for you? And still you reject me till this day. And you still <clears throat> doubt my goodness. And you still choose your will over mine. And you still doubt that I know what's best for you. See, when you look at the Bible from this angle, you'll see you have a God who is almighty, who doesn't need you, but because he loves you, he's allowed himself to enter into your misery and allow himself to be hurt by maggots whom he loves and adores. This understanding shows how much we hurt God and break his heart. And yet he still loves us. It almost moves you to the point of feeling sorry for God, doesn't it? I'm like, why? Right? It's like it makes you feel sorry for the pain that God endures because of his infinite love for us. A God who's almighty, who doesn't need us, can wipe, it off, wipe us out, but he chooses to put up with us in spite of all the pain and hurt we bring to his heart. <clears throat> right? This is our God. So you understand what the tree of the knowledge and good of evil was? Because the Quran is a satanic perversion. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil, the tree of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a choice of trust. A choice of trust. He was saying, look, Adam, for you to love me, it's something you must reciprocate, choose to do. So here's the test. Are you going to choose to love me? Will you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so you can learn good and evil independently from me? Or are you going to say no to the tree because, God, I know you. I know your character. I have seen how much you love me, and I have no doubt of your goodness, and you have my best interests. And I want to now respond to your love by loving you and showing you, God, I trust you. You are infinitely good, and you do have my best interest. And I'll never doubt you, and I'll let you decide for me. So now does everyone understand what the tree of the knowledge and good and evil was? Did it sink in? Because I'm going to have to do Waraka and Muhammad another session. Did it sink in? This is the story of the garden of Adam and Eve and the knowledge of good and evil. You have a choice. You can trust me and rely on me that I have your best interest and I love and adore you more than you can imagine. And I'll always tell you what's best for you and I'll never misguide you. Or you can go ahead and eat of the tree, which will be your way of saying, I don't trust you enough. I'm going to take matters into my own hands and decide what's best for me independently of you. Yeah, it's already archived, Alan Zach. It's on my YouTube. You can upload it. It's yours. That's the story. So I can imagine God knowing that they would choose to distrust him. And God waiting. See, God could have shown up, right, before they ate, but then he would intervene with their will. And so as God sees the serpent tempting Eve and knowing she's going to eat, when she took a bite of the forbidden fruit, it was like someone biting a piece of God's heart and ripping it from his spiritual proverbial chest. So when the Lord saw, right, when the Lord saw, when she ate, it was like Eve ripping his heart apart. <clears throat> Rips his heart apart as he looks and says, you've made your choice. You listen to the voice of a stranger over against the voice of the God who proved himself faithful to you and showed you his great love 
by creating this world and you to rule it. So when she ate, you can imagine the heart of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit, a piece of it being ripped <clears throat> off. <clears throat> And then seeing Adam, when Eve invited him to eat and he ate, another piece of God's heart being ripped off because Adam was saying, I'd rather please her over against you. Genesis 3, 17, 19. Because you obeyed the voice of your wife and you ate of the tree, I told you not to. So when Adam ate, his message to God was, I'd rather please her over against you. I'd rather make her happy over against making you happy. Because she is my delight and my life, not you. And God is looking at Adam saying, Adam, without me, there would be no her. Without me, there would be no you. Without me, you would have no Eve. And this is how you repay me? This is how you repay me? And that's a story. That's the story. No one got it? And the Lord, and notice the Lord, right when they ate, he shows up. See, he didn't show up before they ate. He showed up after they ate because he had to allow them to make the choice. And they made a choice that broke his heart. And after they ate, he then comes down like a father who sees a child in despair, in <clears throat> turmoil, in trouble, and he runs. Son, what have you done? Why? Why couldn't you trust me? Why did you do this? That's the story of Genesis 2 and 3. Is it making sense? Exactly. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6. 100%. Echoed in this passage. That's the story. Yeah, James Unlap, you're about to make me cry. He loved us enough to let us go. And as parents, we know that, right? As parents, we know that because my daughters will grow up. And because I love them, I cannot imprison them, ensnare them. I have to let them free, let them go to make their own choices and live their own life. And that is a parent's nightmare. Any good parent dreads the day where their children grow up and become mature enough to leave home and start their own life. But you have no choice. That's what love does. All right, I have to let you go. Right? Is that clear? So we see Adam and Eve in our children. What do I mean? Our children, before they reach the age of understanding, can be naked in front of each other and not lust for each other and be perverted. But then there's a certain age where they have to be clothed and you can't leave them alone lest they do something. And then they grow up thinking now they know better than you and they rebel against you and defy your orders and they leave and start their own life. Right? That's the story of Adam and Eve being relived in all our lives. We're all Adams and Eves. We start out innocent. Then we become corrupted in our thinking. Then we talk back to our parents and authority thinking we know better and defy them. Then we go out on our own and experience life and hell on our own. And we get lost in the process. We are reliving the story of Adam and Eve. That was Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. And also, it's in Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 29. Did it sink in? So what do we learn? The God of the Quran is Satan. The Quran is a filthy, satanic book of trash and porn that turns the story of the garden upside down saying that Allah creates death, when the Bible says that Satan, Satan brought death by tempting Adam and Eve to rebel, and the Quran says that Allah, 
forbade them to eat of the tree of life, whereas God's steward says it was the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, because all of the Quran wanted man to die from the get-go, proving it's Satan, because the God of the Bible never wanted any creature to die but live forever. You see how beautiful the Genesis story is, brethren? You see how beautiful the Genesis story is? This is why Satan inspires so-called Christians to get you to lose confidence in Genesis. That, hey, science contradicts Genesis. It's a book of fiction, make-believe, and myth. Nobody believes that, literally. Why? Because Satan wants to destroy your confidence in Genesis because he knows therein lies the foundation of our faith and the key unlocking all mysteries. And he has to get you to doubt it. You with me? And so let me end it with these verses. The true God created man for immortality and doesn't want man to die. Here it is, Ezekiel 33. This is the true God. Okay? Ezekiel 33, 10 to 11. Here you go. So there you see the contrast, right? And Lord willing, I'll do Waraka bin Nofal Muhammad separately. I don't want to spoil it by talking about Muhammad. Ezekiel 33, 10 to 11. Say to them, this is the heart of God. As I live, says the Lord God, Adonai Yahuwah. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. This is your God, Christians. This is my God. This is our God. The God of the Bible, the God revealed in Jesus. Do you think I delight that the wicked die, but that the wicked turn from his way and live? Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Wow. I don't know if this guy's lying. He says, I was born as a Muslim, I was, and I was till I turned 23. After 29 years, I prayed to Jesus for the first time. After three hours, I got a sign from him that on, opened my heart to Jesus, so he came and amen. Now, let me show you what the Bible says when God punishes you for your sin. Did you know the Bible says when God punishes you, he does it reluctant, reluctantly? Here it is, Lamentations 3, 31 to 33. We're going to wrap it up. Lamentations 3, 31 to 33. Pay attention to verse 33 and let it break your heart. Brethren, we're going to end it right here after this. Lamentation chapter 3, verses 31 to 33. Watch. Look at 33. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he caused grief, he causes you grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Why? For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the sons of men. Let that verse be etched in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Did you catch it? Lamentations 3, 31, 33. God does not willingly, he doesn't want to afflict you, harm you, hurt you. He doesn't want to, so he's pleading with you. Please don't leave me. In a position where I have no choice but to punish you. He's pleading with you. God who doesn't need you. The God of the Bible who's almighty. Who doesn't need you or me. The God revealed in Jesus. Who doesn't need us. But he's pleading with you. I do not willingly. I do not delight in having to grieve you. In having to punish you. Please don't get me to the point where I have to. Lamentations 3, 31, 33. This is the true God, unlike all of the Quran, who is Satan. See? Do you see that there? For he does not willingly afflict. He doesn't desire or delight to afflict or grieve the sons of men. But he has to if you don't repent, because a good father disciplines rebellious children for their own good. And if you keep hardening against his rebellion, that like a good parent, he says, you're free to go. You won't listen to me. You won't heed my correction. 
then you cannot live in my house anymore. You break my heart, but I have to throw you out. Go out and live your own life, right? Get your own place because you won't respect me. You won't honor me. You keep defying me and rebelling against me. Then there is no place for you in my home anymore. You have to leave. There you go. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus is Jehovah Almighty in the flesh. The eternal love of the Father. The eternal companion spirit. He is our God, our Lord, our love, our life. May the Lord Jesus wash, cleanse, purify all of us. Our loved ones, my daughters, their mother Michelle, to fully repent in the blood of Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus fill all of us. Our loved ones, my daughters, Michelle, with the Holy Spirit to never betray or deny or blaspheme or shame or disown Jesus Christ. Never fall into any scandal, but love the Lord Jesus with perfect obedience. Like Adam and Eve shown, we trust you, Lord. We know you know what's best for us, and we trust in you. Save us from our flesh. Save us from the world. Save us from Satan to die to our own desires and trust in you. We love you. We need you, Lord Jesus, Lord of glory, our love, our life. Increase in us. And finish the work you've begun in us until you summon us until you return. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. We trust in you. We love you. Do not allow us to deny you, doubt you, or sin against you, but love you perfectly by your power, even unto death until you return. And Lord Jesus, bring my daughters to me and remove Martin from them. In your name, Lord Jesus. And Theotokos, pray for us. Holy Mother, pray for us. We desire your intercession. Now, brethren, if you believe the Lord is using me, don't stop praying for my daughters and I. Pray for their mother to truly submit to the Lord. Leave Martin behind. Pray the Lord grant all four of us divine, miraculous, physical safety, security, protection, and health. Ask the Lord to give me discipline to stay healthy and fit and use my health to glorify him, to set me free from bondage to food and lust, that my daughters will grow up to be godly women. I'll be there with them to see that happen if the Lord tarries and they outlive me. And pray that the financial support stays steady so I can do this work by the Spirit to teach you the beauty of your God, the beauty of his word, and how miraculous the Bible is. Because the God of the Bible is miraculous and he's real. And this is his voice. May we be in love with that voice in Scripture, enslaved to that voice in Scripture, live out that voice in Scripture, and proclaim it even unto death. For you are worthy, Father. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are worthy, Holy Spirit. Amen. Maranatha. Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And pray for David and Marie Wood, who lost their son Reed, who's with Jesus, and he's waiting there, perfectly healthy and whole, to be reunited to them. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Take care. I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Take care.